Good evening and welcome to tonight's city special city council meeting for Thursday, August 17th, 2017. Uh, we will begin with a roll call and determination of quorum. Roberts. Here. Drury. Here. Laurenti. Here. Armstrong. Here. Lewis. Solomon. Here. Modric. Here. Nordstrom. Here. Drew. Here. Scott. Here. We have quorum. Thank you very much. Next, we will go on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So tonight what we're here to do is to continue uh, our working session on the mayor's proposed budget for this next year. And we have a number of items to get to tonight. And so what we're going to do is start with uh, the uh, de city departments. And tonight we have uh, various department heads and staff uh, on hand to answer questions. And so for the council, just so you know what's going on, we have the order in which on the agenda in which uh, they will be available for uh, questions I I have offered a few minutes in case they want to make any summary comments uh, and then open it up to questions and so to kick it off we have the city attorney's office and Joel Landine is here and available for questions and so Joel do you need a few minutes at all to discuss any priorities for the next year um, not really the unique thing about my budget is it's almost entirely salary and benefits so I have very little uh, ability to change it although we had over the years put some money in some contingency funds and while the mayor's office was trying to balance the budget we did decrease some of those so I'd actually show that um, I think my budget when I calculated it uh, between the amount budgeted in 2017 and the amount budgeted for next year only increased by five thousand six hundred ninety one dollars so we're doing what we can um, but there's none there's no budget request to do any of our uh, projects or any of our goals for next year. It's nothing that we had to budget extra money for or anything. So it's all in basically salary and wages. Okay. Uh, stand by for any potential questions from council members. Do you have any questions? We're going to Alderman Laurenti. Thank you, Chair. And if I may, the city attorney. Absolutely. Joel, on the your office and your budget as we kind of got into that a little bit last week or last week Tuesday it feels like it was last week <laughs> it was Tuesday um, I wanted to get your opinion on and we like I said we delved into the the subject of ours and because uh, your department in particular has a deals with a lot of interdepartmental charges or I should say you provide services to many of the different areas of the city. And so um, that's a big part of your revenue. My question to you is how, I just want your opinion, how difficult and how long those two things would it take to implement um, the ability to better track the hours and minutes spent working for other departments? Um, I certainly think it's possible. It depends on what we do. My preference would be, as I indicated on Tuesday night, I, uh, the council authorized our office to purchase a law office management software. We did not uh, include the module that had timekeeping, but one of the things I did look at when we made the choice of which program to go to is to obtain one that did have a module for timekeeping in the event that at some point it was decided we should start um, individually tracking hours for either um, this purpose or, you know, there are other purposes for tracking the, the time spent. And I have not reached out to the company at this point and found out what the cost or the time for implementation would be. I'd certainly hope that if, if we went that route that we could do it by the end of the year and get it implemented for the start of 2018 it might be a reasonable goal to set. Um, you know, I don't know how much it would cost. I don't think it's anything that in the overall scope of the city budget is going to break the bank. I'm guessing $10,000 range. And 
even if they did not, if the council didn't want to authorize the funds for that purpose, I mean, certainly we could go to tracking by other means either. I don't think they'd be as effective and it wouldn't be as easy, but I mean, if we had to, we could go to tracking it on paper. So right. that's something we could implement more quickly, but it's probably got different issues with it as far as making sure people are doing their time and and keeping track of it and a little more management side rather than just having a, a computer program where you can enter it in and i could easily run reports and track it and i appreciate that um on that because what was important to me as i said tuesday night was the accountability to the taxpayer i mean interdepartmental charges are as we know still quite large not what they used to be but it's still a lot of money and so I guess my last question to you is, do you feel like, and I know there are other benefits um, of having de um, your department tracking what you're doing for all the other departments when it comes to interdepartmental charges, um, as far as quantifying the value, um, do you think that would get better or worse for your, your, your department as far as quantifying those interdepartmental charges and what you should be billing um, to these other areas of the city? Do you feel like that improves, gets worse? Do you feel like there's a, the, the evaluation of your office's time is pretty good now? And will tracking it improve valuating that particular or the valuation of your office's time? You know, it certainly would be more accurate and I've had previous department director state to me, you know, if I could just get a bill and almost, I think they think, oh, it'd be great if we could treat it like a real law office. Well, it's great in a year that they don't use our services much and get a small bill, but the first year they get a huge bill and they're like, Ugh. you know, we didn't budget for that. I don't think it's going to be good. I think we have to probably, if you want my opinion, find something that everyone can accept. The department directors, the council, the mayor can accept as a a fair and equitable way to determine what it is. But I also think there has to be some stability. And one of the difficulties I've said with doing interdepartmental charges in my office by hourly is it is going to, in some cases, fluctuate wildly year to year. Mm -hmm. Some like planning are probably gonna be fairly consistent year to year. The one, and ironically, the ones that are gonna fluctuate are gonna be the enterprise funds, airport, um, civic center, library, that we have a lawsuit or we have something, a project that takes a lot of time in that year, it's going to spike. You know, I think when we talked after the meeting, I threw out a couple ideas and I, I haven't given this a ton of thought and there may be problems with these too, but I mean, you could look at if you wanted something that was, you know, more predictable and more stable is figure out, you know what the cost of our office is, you know what the cost of finance is. And you could say, okay, the Civic Center budget is this, look at what all the entities paying interdepartmental charges are, and what percentage of their budget is the total, come up with a percentage, and then they pay that percentage in the interdepartmental charges with the idea that if you have a bigger budget, you would probably demand more services from the finance and attorney's office, and that's not gonna be, you know, as accurate as say an hourly, but is that fair? Um, you could look at the number of employees maybe that the department has as a measure of it or, or some combination of that and come up with some formula that maybe was at least predictable and say, we all accept that's fair. If you want to do a timekeeping, I have the ability to keep track of the time and to implement that. It would, wouldn't, I don't think take too long and we could do that but I don't know that it solves the interdepartmental charge problem completely because it's not going to provide you a stability factor. No, so. I, and I, I agree with you, Joel, and I appreciate your comments. I just feel like it will bring some, accountabil some accountability to it, um, even if it's somewhat uh, uh, perception. And I don't want to say it that way, but part of it would be that. I mean, obviously, it would help nail down the valuation of your office's time at a minimum. Um, and I agree with you, there are certain departments that um, that need your services more uh, during certain years than others. 
but I don't know that we haven't, we aren't experience, experiencing new litigation that we haven't seen before. So these other department directors obviously could budget. You know, I mean, uh, they know their history of litigation and, and whether they have one or two major cases, if you will, each year or on the average, where they can build that into their budgets as well. But I agree with you that we need to go down this road. At least I feel like we need to go down this road so that we can explain to the taxpayers better not only what your office does, but what it costs the taxpayers um, and have a better grip on litigation um, for all of the different departments. So I appreciate your comments. Go ahead. I, I would just add one other thing. You know, I know there's uh, the council has struggled with this idea of interdepartmental charges and using enterprise funds to um, subsidize the general fund. But something that you have to, to realize is that, and this budget demonstrates it, we're already short of revenue in our general fund. There's already funding issues on the funding side. You know, the irony is the city as a whole isn't in financial trouble. If you looked at create as one pot of money, there's more than enough in that one pot of money. It's this one particular fund that it's become apparent we're having an issue with where you don't have enough revenue in that fund to cover the amount of services you have. So it's being supplemented from these other areas. So if you have a year and, and let's say it turns out my office spends the majority of its time and now we don't do interdepartmental charges between general fund to general fund in that in that year the majority of our time is spent on the general fund and not on enterprise funds so that convert it lowers the amount of interdepartmental charges coming back into my department you may end up with an additional hundred thousand dollar shortage in the general fund so you know you're potentially solving a problem for the enterprise fund, but you're then just shifting it over and creating a new problem potentially in the general fund. Yeah, and I agree with that. I, I totally agree with that, ex except on the, the, the fact that we can say that from your office, what you charge to other departments is justified by the fact that you track this time and we know the fixed costs of your office and I think that's that part of it alone is is extremely important along with some of the other fringe benefits that come from um, such a system for your office as well so for your personnel so um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna okay. yield on that particular subject but I'm hoping we can delve into that as we get into this next yeah, we'll, we'll be dealing with interdepartmental charges uh, later on in the agenda, but thank you for your feedback. We're going to go to Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, uh, Joel, as I'm looking at your budget, one of the first things that I get asked uh, out there in the community is, why do we need seven attorneys, excuse me, five attorneys and two staff people in, the, in your office? And, and uh, there's more more to the question, but essentially uh, that, that that's the summation of that that question. You know, and I uh, honestly get asked that myself. Um, I don't think people appreciate the amount of support we give and the amount of meetings and and level of service. Um, if you count, if you cut attorneys, would the city survive and keep operating? Sure, but the level of service would go down. Um, we have an attorney who, so all the attorneys have primary assignments. So my primary is handling uh, questions from council, dealing with council things, major policy, mayor, and managing the outside litigation among just little things that come in every day and little fires that need to be put out. Um, Wade Nyberg uh, primarily supports public works department and finance in the airport. He goes out to all the airport board meetings and frankly, there's enough work generated in our public works department, contract review, um, easements to be obtained, all of those things to keep an attorney busy. Then um, Carla Cushman in my office, she supports planning, library, um, parks department, and again, planning, reviewing all the routings, answering questions, drafting ordinances, and all everything that goes with that, staffing the planning commission, staffing the zoning board, reviewing those, and commenting on all those. Again, enough work for a single attorney to keep busy. 
Uh, Jess Rogers in my office primarily supports um, the Human Relations Commission and the HR department. Right now, HR is short-staffed, and frankly, we're trying to draft some policies and do some things, and we're in the middle of some transitions, and it is definitely eating up all of her time to staff and support that. And then Kinsley Groot in our office does all the city ordinance violation prosecutions, she um, does code enforcement, works with landowners. She's working on the housing issues as far as the low-income housing and obtaining properties. Some of the properties we've obtained in which we're trying to turn around and use as opportunities to create low-income housing. And again, building any building code violations in any of that. And again, we have enough work for an attorney. I will say the irony to me, it's almost like um, I look at it almost like a jail. There's kind of a joke. If you, if you keep building jail cells, it seems like you keep filling them. When I started with the city, there were three attorneys, and that was in 2004. And it seems like we were less busy when we had three attorneys in 2004 than it seems like we are now. And we have five attorneys. And, and that doesn't seem right, but I'm just telling you that's my perception of it. Um, and... I, I just really don't think we're an organization of 800 employees and multiple departments, and people may not realize they think we're just in court and doing litigation, that I'm attending meetings in public works, I'm attending meetings at the fire department, I'm, you know, there's a lot, because we have attorneys available, the departments are coming to us and asking us things before they become a problem, before they become a lawsuit, so they don't become a lawsuit. You know, I'd also say a lot of the smaller, South Dakota is mostly a rural state, and there's two really large cities that have internal um, city attorney offices. And over the last several years, more and more cities are, um, they're stopping. They've, in the past, just contracted out with a private attorney to provide legal support. I would say Spearfish, Huron, and Mitchell in the last five years have all brought, got rid of the contracts and brought in in-house attorneys because they see the benefit of having the attorneys in-house and it's actually um, a lot less expensive. I, thank you, Joel. I, I uh, understand what you're saying. Um, and going into your budget line items, and I'm looking at the uh, uh, budget final report that I've got in front of me and it's, um, the big thick book, but I'm looking at uh, the items that are red, highlighted in red, and it looks like the mayor is proposing a, a, a cut to your budget by seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. Round numbers. I think my math is pretty close. If if that is the case, then how do you plan to absorb that? It looks like you're able to, but I just want to make sure that you're able to absorb that. Uh, decrease of 17500 by the mayor's proposal. Yes, I um, discussed this with Sean. We were looking for additional cuts, and I gave him the ideas. And if you look, in the printout I have isn't colored, so it's a little more difficult. But sure. I'm trying to, on the second page, when it looks at the variance over in the 2018 request, you can see where the cuts are. So... I have a professional services line item that's ten thousand that's seventeen thousand five hundred that's being reduced to seven thousand five hundred to down to ten thousand. That was something that actually came up when uh, Sam Quaker was mayor and that was added in because we had some need. Honestly, over the last couple of years we haven't had the need for that. And that's why when you look at I, when you look at the 2016 actual, it's significantly lower than the 2017 uh, requested. But I'm guessing that the 2016 requested is much closer. And the reason is because we didn't use things like the professional services. Quite frankly, the reason I was supportive of having a professional services is once in a while we get a need for somebody like an appraiser or something like that or uh, maybe gives us the opportunity for an outside legal opinion. And I've seen situations where we had in particular one involved 
a department and a former director where we had a huge fight over a, who was going to pay for an appraisal. And I thought it was kind of silly. So I just decided in the future, if there was money in the budget, I would just have that and I would just pay the bill and not have to engage in that. And I'm not, I wasn't worried about it. I think 10,000 is sufficient. If we need additional professional services, uh, I would think it would be fine to come in and then we can justify that and get a supplemental appropriation. But when I, when I talked to Sean about it, I agreed that could be lowered. As you can see, we, I think, lowered our supplies and materials and that was based on looking at previous expenditures and what we felt comfortable with. And then we also uh, did reduce travel and training a little bit. The other area, uh, staying on the red highlighted areas, is computers and software. Um, if we're going to have that discussion about additional accounting, um, will that what you have in your current budget be able to account for that? Difference? Well, I mean, part of that was we we looked at our equipment and what we purchased. Um, I'll just put in a plug. I hope someday we go to centralized IT where the individual departments don't have to be Agreed. purchasing their own computers and things like that. But um, everybody's pretty up to date on their computer, so it doesn't look like we're going to have a lot of computer needs. Although I've had computers uh, fail before their time, so we left some money in there. So we're, I think we're covered. Um, I don't know as far as the software if there's going to be sufficient money in there. And because I haven't talked to the software vendor and don't know what it's going to cost, I, I frankly would need to do that. And then if it isn't sufficient, then I will come back. Although, frankly, at this point, it'd be on this year's budget, and I could probably shift money from professional services and the other line items to cover it without, you know, an additional, a supplement above and beyond what you've already authorized for our office. I don't think I'm going to have to go... If I, if I were to purchase additional software this year, I don't think I'm going to have to go above and beyond what you've already budgeted for me for this year. It would just come out of a line item that's being underutilized. Thank you. I'll, I'll consider heads up, standing by for um, just in case you need a supplemental for your budget. I, I want to go back to you the beginning, one of your beginning uh, comments that you made on that. I had to chuckle a little bit about a real attorney's office. You mentioned that we have some real attorney offices out there in the other world besides so I, forgive me i just had to have a little bit of a chuckle with that i i think you still are a, a, a real attorney's office so just for comparative reasons the other part that that uh, that interests me is uh you're designated as one of the central services for the city of, of rapid city um what what i'm thinking and I need a little bit more confirmation on this it appears that some of these departments require a lot of attorney time to me what it looks like with other departments that need your time or your office time um, it would be more costly if we did that on the outside uh, to to have that support service so to me, it looks like you're doing a, a great service for uh, for the city and the citizens so that your, your office is actually saving the city uh, or the departments a lot of money in that case if they had to go out and contract it out. So thank you for that. And I also wanted to say uh, I spend a lot of time with your attorneys. And so again, they... Uh, uh, Kinsley, I spend an enormous amount of time with her, and then also you spend a little bit of time with Jessica as well. And you're being able to have your office staff accommodate me. I just want to say thank you for that as well, because I do take up a lot of their time. So, um, and, and so I appreciate the support. Thank you. I'll yield. Thank you, Alderman Nordstrom. So, just as a reminder to the council, uh, we. We have 11 more departments to go through, and uh, we'd like to get through them. So if we can kind of get to it, let's, if we can get to 10 or 15 minutes per person at the most, um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but I think we all want to make good use of our time. And thank you, uh, Mr. Landine, for 
the questions. Next, we're going to go to Community Planning and Development, which is Public Works Director Dale Tech. Uh, he is also going to be answering questions regarding community resources, if there are any. Is that correct? Dale? Yes, actually, three of the divisions in community resources, yeah. GIS, uh, community development, and code enforcement, if there are any questions for those three. And also, if it's okay with the council, I'd like to allow him to answer questions regarding public works while, while he's up here as well. So, But we'll go in that order. We'll go community planning and development, and then any questions related to community services, if you have any, and then finally, we'll go to public works just to, so that we're not all over the place. Does that make sense? All right, uh, Mr. Tech, do you have any uh, summary comments for the council regarding community planning and development? I do not have any uh, for community development. Uh, actually, if you would prefer, I can kind of go through everything first here and make my comments, if that's okay with the council. Um, so in community planning and development services, I don't have any. There's a slight increase in professional services that will be used uh, as part of our long-range transportation planning. Uh, most of that money will be reimbursed by the State Department of Transportation as planning funds, so uh, we have to budget the whole amount. Uh, we do anticipate that they will be reimbursed. Uh, in community resources, particularly the GIS division, uh, there's a request for $120,000 for new aerial photography for the city of Rapid City. Uh, approximately every two years, the city reflies or makes a request to refly the city and get new aerial photos, which is used by most departments in the city as well as most of our citizens, uh, real estate professionals, engineers, uh, many, many people in our community use our rapid map. Uh, so it's important to keep that updated. Um, I don't have any comment as far as community development or Barb Garcia's programs. Uh, or code enforcement, those budgets are relatively constant and not a lot of change there. And then as far as public works is concerned, I'll jump right into that. Uh, there is a request for one FTE in our street department. Um, we have roughly 21 school routes. Uh, we've recently annexed a portion of Rapid Valley, including the Big Sky area. Uh, we're going to have to have some response out there for snow removal. So the, the primary uh, request is for uh, FTE in the street department to provide service for snow removal as well as street cleaning. Um, and I believe that's about all the comments I have at this point in time, so I'll take any questions from the council. Okay. First set of questions for community planning and development, if any of the council have any. We'll go to Alderwoman Drew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dale, so how many um, employees do we have in the code enforcement um, division? How many people are actually out doing that work? I believe there are three. There are two officers and then a supervisor officer. Do um, you feel that's enough? Because if there's any comments I get that, you know, code enforcement is um, not really effective, um, you know, not to dis <laughs> disparage that department, but whether it's weeds or snow or whatever it is that, you know, that might be something you, you should look at for um, expanding the number of employees there. I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, <laughs> the, the three officers that we have stay plenty busy. I know they Could do. we add three more? Certainly. Uh, I don't know that it's in the city's best interest, though, to all of a sudden have uh, a whole fleet of code enforcement officers that are knocking on everyone's doors. I don't think it is either, but I'm thinking that maybe, you know, we should be looking at at least one more because that's that's a complaint that I hear quite often. You know, the I know it might seem like a minor inconvenience to some people, but, you know, the trees hanging over the sidewalks or over the roads and, you know, the weeds that are growing up in, in someone's yard. I know we can't be the everything police, but I just... I just think that we could do a better job, you know, so that would be a little bit more spread out. So I guess what I'm saying is maybe for next year you might want to think about increasing the number of people in that department. Duly noted. Thank you. Thank you, Alderwoman Drew. We'll now go to Alderwoman Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Mr. Tech, just a follow-up question on Alderwoman Drew's um, line of questioning. It seems when I've asked this in the past, it's kind of a gray area as far as code enforcement goes because 
we have a lot of code violations on the books that if a code enforcement officer were to just hit a neighborhood and start walking, they would probably be able to write a lot of different things. And the ones that come to mind are RVs, boats, everything else that is not behind the front of the building may not be on concrete or rock. I mean, there's a lot of gray area out here where in the past it seems like the mayor has not wanted a lot of heavy enforcement for some of the codes that are on our books. Is, is that still? I don't know that I can speak for the mayor, but you know, the, it's just like any service the city provides. Over, over time, there's been a level of service provided, and I believe the community has been comfortable with that. I'm, I'm hearing, though, tonight that there are, other, there, are, there are interests in our community to do more. Uh, but over the last decade, I, it's been pretty consistent as far as the level of code enforcement, the level of service uh, out there. The code violations that our officers are out there enforcing, it has an effect on the, on the neighboring, on the neighbors. If they see their neighbor doing, getting a code violation, that drives them into compliance too. So instead of trying to be out and hitting everybody, it's, it's almost an educational thing for the neighborhoods that they're out in and, and making um, their enforcement actions on. So. I, I don't see it as being an issue today. Uh, we may want to evaluate it in a year or two to see if, if we can, if we're having issues with getting compliance with the violations that we are writing. Well, I will say, just my personal observation in visiting with the constituents in Ward 4 um, in North Rapid, uh, since Matt has been out, and, and it has primarily been Matt because I've contacted him a couple times, um, he's really got a system down, and I will give him a lot of kudos because it's, it's a really good. He goes out to a neighborhood, they send a letter out, and they say, we're going to be in your neighborhood. These are some code enforcement things, and it kind of gives the homeowners and property owners a heads up that these are code violations. Mm -hmm. And then they usually come back a couple weeks later, and if there's anything that's really out of code, those are the ones that they kind of, you know, write up. The, the other thing, though, is that for the most part, and I think w where I was going with this, let me just speak plainly. A lot of times, code enforcement is the neighbor calls on a neighbor. And a lot of our neighbors, including myself, don't want to start a war in our neighborhood. So, you know, y even though those weeds may bother you, <laughs> you know, y you may have something else, like an RV that, you know, it's just a little bit out of, so I'm not going to call in on those weeds because I want to keep my RV parked in here. I don't want to have to pay for a park someplace else. So it seems like the code enforcement that Matt has in place, and I'm just commenting on, on Alderwoman Drews, I think it is getting better, and I think they're actually putting a plan in to get that education piece out for all of our citizens to, citizens to know what the codes actually are and what is a violation of our code. So I would like to just say thank you, um, but I do know that some of our citizens out there, they're, they're black and white people. If it's written up that it's a violation, oh, they want it taken care of now. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times that may not happen unless they're willing to sign their name to the complaint in order to draw attention to it. So yeah. I think it's getting better, but like anything, I think it's going to take time mm -hmm. to get those improvements out there. Probably. But I do congratulate Matt. I, I know I've heard, I've seen it in my neighborhoods, and I've heard it from my um, constituents. They do like the letter ahead of time because a lot of times they just simply were not aware of it. So thank you. Okay, we'll go to Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will be brief this time. <laughs> so um, D Dale, one of the things that I've noticed on the uh, uh, code enforcement side, we get these reports basically on a monthly basis. And one of the things that we like to really appreciate one of the things to look at is uh, we, we are st starting to get what I call frequent flyers, a lot of repeat offenders, multiple uh, uh, abatements that are taking place. So if, if there's a way that you or the code enforcement people could take a look at that to see if we can make some kind of adjustment to that. I don't know what the answer is at this point, 
got several ideas, but if you could take a look at the frequent flyers, what we're experiencing. Thank you. Yield. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to any questions regarding community resources for Mr. Tech, if there are any. Going once, twice. All right, we'll move on. Any questions regarding public works for Mr. Tech? Alderwoman Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Mr. Tech, we'll probably be able to talk about this when we do get to the interdepartmental charges, but I know that the CIP fund has a huge amount, and I believe it goes to finance and the public works, or maybe it's just the finance department, but there's a huge amount from the CIP fund that gets brought into the general fund. Is that to offset wages of the planners and the public works project engineers, or what, what is that used to offset? That probably is more of a question for Pauline, but yes, I believe that is correct. Um, our engineers, our project managers in, in public works engineering manage the projects, the CIP projects. They're the ones doing the scoping, the budgeting, the management of consultants, the management of the construction, so it's from uh, cradle to grave, if you will, project management of those CIP projects. Well, it looks like, if I, and I'm just trying to go from memory here, that when the mayor presented that part of his um, reshuffling of those two pennies, which affects the CIP fund, is that in the ordinance itself, it's set that a certain percentage of the total value of the CIP is what is moved over to the general fund. So, like I said, that may be a better discussion when we talk about the interdepart interdepartmental charges. Um, it kind of goes along the lines of what um, Alderman Laurenti was saying, and that is it, if those are truly offsetting, a million dollars is offsetting the wages of some engineers and some planners, the question just kind of begs, is it really, do we really need that much into the general fund? Would, would you really, if we didn't have those projects from CIP, let go project engineers? Th that, that's kind of the offset. Um, because if the, uh, the engineers are already being paid from the general fund and they're just taking on additional projects, then I can see offsetting their cost. But um, I just question the million dollars. So, Well, actually, there's, there's even more from our uh, enterprise funds. So the engineers, inspectors, project administrators in, in the office also do work for water, water reclamation, and solid waste. So there's funds, uh, interdepartmental charges from those funds as well that supplement uh, what the Public Works Engineering Admin Cost Center does. Which even increases the a million dollars from CIP to something even higher once you start Correct. adding in all the water departments and stuff. So thank you, Ms. Chair, I yield. Thank you, and I'll go to Mr. Lorenzi. Thank you, Chair, and if I may, Dale Tech, of course. Dale, on... Uh, the proposed infusion of funds from Vision to CIP, how do you feel about that being employed in the next budget year? Do you think there's some ramping up in the public works area that's gonna be necessary from the private standpoint of getting RFPs out and, and contracting those RFPs? Are we gonna be able to do that with the current um, proposal? Actually, I believe so, because last year, uh, if you recall, there were two uh, engineering positions that were added to the, to the budget. So we've got two people on staff now that will help um, th that increase. They were hired specifically to uh, help manage our water and wastewater projects that we have going on, but certainly uh, I believe that with our current workforce that we would be able to handle that additional funding that's coming to the CIP. If, if, for, if uh, in a dream world, if that infusion were three or four times what the projection is, what you're feeling about that? If it's three or four times, then yeah, we would need to speak about adding more staff to handle that. Do you believe that we would be able to contract that kind of funding to sewer and streets in a, every budget year? Can we contract it? Absolutely. Yeah, can we contract yeah. it? If we had the staff here, my question is, can we get, do we have enough contractors out there who have staff 
that can, because obviously it will greatly accelerate our, the capital improvement plan and, and uh, the five-year outlook about getting streets done. Obviously, I would assume we would be able to do more every year. So in the private world, do you feel like we have that capacity? I've actually had this conversation with our okay. AGC group uh, here, our Associated General Contractors, the Department of Transportation, myself, uh, other city staff meet with our local contractors regularly. Um, that they want the work. They say that they can gear up. They say that they can get the work done. So I, I don't feel that the funding levels that we're proposing uh, would have any effect on their ability to get the work done. Uh, even if it were to increase two or threefold of what the proposal is, I believe our local contracting community can step up and do the work. Very good. I appreciate that. I yield. Thank you. We'll now go to Alderwoman Drew. Thank you. Another question for Dale, please. Um, and this is a softball, so you'll like this one. Um, uh, so one of the best things I think that's happened in public works in, in the transportation department is that we're doing the free rides for students and, and for kids. Now that program lasted all summer, correct? Yes. I know Rich is not here, but was that any extra cost to the city to do this for the last year? As far as the summer is concerned? Well, as far as the students are concerned. Yeah. He, at, the, at the onset of this program, Rich estimated, I think, that we would see a reduction in the amount of fees that we collected by about $15,000, $16,000, somewhere in there. Uh, and I believe after we've gotten through this first year, that's almost exactly where it came in at, the reduction of fees. So we're out there providing a service. The bus is going around and around. It doesn't matter if it's hauling one person or 15 people. The bus is still going. So we've had the capacity um, for the additional riders, if you will, and we accounted for that reduction in revenues from selling the kid passes, if you will. So. It's been a very successful program, I, and we, we hope wonderful. that it continues. Um, so has there been any um, conversation about sharing this expense of uh, the reduction that we've gotten in fees with the school board? I don't know that there has. Um, there's a press conference tomorrow morning to talk about this very thing uh, with the school, so I, I don't know that it'll attend. be addressed at the time, but uh, <laughs> certainly it'll be discussing the program. How about more routes? Has anybody thought about more routes for the, the, this particular thing just so that the kiddos might be able to attend more camps and stuff that they don't have a access to after school? Well, look, you know, we have six routes, six fixed routes. So adding a new route is quite expensive. Um, we're probably talking half a million dollars by the time you invest in the additional personnel to staff the uh, the buses, the purchase of the capital, um, you know, purchase buses, uh, put up bus stops, so on and so forth. It gets to be quite expensive. Our ridership now is in a good place. We can handle it. Um, I think there may be a point on some of the existing routes where we may have to add a bus for our peak times. So instead of uh, a bus every half hour like we have, uh, one might be full, so we may have to have another one coming right behind it for our peak a.m. and p.m. Uh, hours, and, and that would be it, I think, in the next four or five years. Anyway, uh, Would that be an additional cost to the city, or what happens there? We have a fleet of, well, I shouldn't say a fleet, we have a number of old buses that we keep in service, so it's not like we have to go purchase a new bus to, to uh, uh, help that demand, if you will. Um, question is just finding a driver to staff the bus so okay I make it, make it to the press conference tomorrow so I can hear more thank you Dale okay I don't see any other questions in the queue or any comments in the queue so we'll now move on to the finance department and uh, uh, Pauline Sumption our finance officer do you have any opening remarks for us Pauline I'll just do a highlight for the general fund items specifically I have four org codes within that within the general fund uh, not taken into account the interdepartmental charges the changes that were made for 2018 in, in those areas we still cut about a hundred between the mayor and I we still cut about 110 to 120 thousand um, dollars one of those is an FTE that we are authorized but we have not filled the position 
and for a couple of years now because we're trying to implement all of our software and see where the need truly is before we actually hire somebody. It may not be a current job title that we have now, so we're, we're kind of holding off on that. Um, and so obviously with that comes the benefits. Another one in 2017, we had budgeted $25,000 for some um, facelifting in the finance office. And I, if you didn't see us before, you should, you probably wouldn't notice it, but if you've been in our office before, uh, we got new carpet and new paint, and it's kind of nice having that little bit of facelift, and the employees have been very appreciative. I obviously don't need that next year, so that was cut from the budget. Also with the new terms in, um, for the elected officials, both for the mayor and for the council, next year we will not have an election. That was a $65,000 reduction in my budget. However, the conversation when I, when I did that um, was that community resources could have it for GIS in 2018 for their um, mapping that they have to do every so often, but that I'm gonna need it back in 2019 because I'm gonna have an election in 2019. Uh, so those, those are the highlights, also uh, reduced a little bit in um, the publishing costs. Okay. And I don't see anybody in the queue. I have a question for you on that position that you haven't filled in two years. I'm assuming you're not coming back to us to try to get that position since nobody hasn't been needed in a couple of years? Not now. I would like to still have the authorization to have it, maybe bring it into the 2019 budget. We just fully implemented the the Tyler software this year was our last module that we had to implement with utility billing. We're still working on the parking tickets. So we wanna see where the need truly is or if there is a need. But until we have a full year or so under our belts with the full implementation, I don't think we can determine that today. One of the benefits of software is it's supposed to help reduce the cost for manpower. Uh, that's something that when we have it, we don't have to have as much staff. This Tyler system, has it helped us reach a reduction in the number of FTEs we need to do the job, or do we still need people there uh, to push a button or whatever you know that is needed? I will tell you when we, I'm gonna step back to the, the previous software, because we implemented that shortly after I started with the city 10 years ago. Um, that's when we started scanning in all the invoices and everybody thought, oh, it's gonna be less work, it's gonna be less work, it's gonna, you can get rid of an accounts payable clerk. We had to add an accounts payable clerk after we implemented that software because it's a time consuming. Um, the work that, not only scanning it, but then all the other stuff that they have to do within the system so that it's available and coded correctly and, and all that. So it actually added workload to us. Um, the jury's still out right now. I know there are some labor intense issues going on with the utility billing side of it, which is not within my office, but um, still reflect, will end up reflecting on my office if, if we have to change something. In addition, depending on what we end up doing with parking tickets, um, right now it is a little more time consuming for my office for the, the parking tickets. And so we're trying to work with Tyler to get that streamlined as well. So jury's still out on that one. Pauline, do we have as many people coming in to pay their water bills as we did before? physically coming into our brick and mortar you, building to pay it? You know, the ones that have chosen to pay online, we don't know how they necessarily paid before. Okay. We never had a way to really track that if they came in or I guess we did. We had some that um, the mail would always go out to the, the line, right? You see if there's a line and whether people are busy or not. Are we, are we less busy? It seems like that? it, but here's the but. caveat. We added another station as well. Okay. When we implemented Tyler, we now have two cashiering stations in the utility or in the cashier's office. Where before we only had one computer, one register where we could take those. So it it could be partly that, but it also could be partly because we have the two stations now instead of just one. So the aim would be great if people are paying their water bills online, mm -hmm. and not everybody is yet. But that should reduce the amount of staff we need to collect and and uh, serve those bills on premises. Correct. Over time. Correct. Over time, it, if if people continue to pay online, it, it could reduce. We will keep monitoring that to oh, make absolutely. sure our staff levels aren't bloated there. Absolutely. And adjust it to somewhere that's needed. Nobody likes to work somewhere where they're not busy. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll keep monitoring that. Okay. At least I don't. I like to keep busy. Yeah. <laughs> it makes my day go faster and absolutely. a lot more enjoyable. Okay. So. Very good. Uh, Alderman Lorenzi, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Pauline. 
on your interdepartmental charges, because yes. they're a growing one for you. My question for you on this is basically the same question I had for the city attorney. The ability to employ, the ability to track all of those hours um, so that we can better quantify who's using your office, how much they're using your office, and the actual value of what your office provides to all these different departments. We know it's invaluable, but what's important, I think, is that we be able to say your office did a thousand hours for whatever department, 500 for this department, 265 for this department, and the value of the exact value of that because you have fixed costs just like the city attorney's office. How hard will that be to do by the end of 2018 as the city attorney believes that they could do it? Honestly. And would we need, need to buy something different? Is there a module that we might need to buy for the new system that you have? Unlike the attorney's office, I don't currently have software that would cover that. And honestly, we would have to change the way we do business almost completely. Um, we have for, so I'm gonna take the, the cashier's office. It's not like everybody for, that's paying their water bill comes in at the same time to pay their water bill, and so I dedicated one hour's time to water bills, and then everybody comes in and pays their parking tickets, so I dedicated an hour to parking tickets, and somebody came in and, you know, everyone came in and paid their building permits. That's not how it happens in our office. In the same regard, on the accounts payable side, it's not like one person only works on one department. Um, we work on vendors as a whole, not, and so to, then we would have to have somebody sorting out invoices by department somehow, mm -hmm. um, instead of by the, and I just, I honestly, I don't think it's, it would be easy at all to do that in the finance office because of the work that we do in those areas. There's some things that we probably could time a little bit better, um, but it's more of the people that work on specific projects, mm -hmm. but the ones that do the day-to-day -day grind work, probably not gonna happen. It's gonna have to be an estimate like we do now. So to that, I'm glad you said estimate because the whole point of tracking it, at least even for a partial amount of time in a year, would be able to quantify what it takes one of your one of your people that works with you to be able to process uh, something for the fire department or for the police department, tickets for the police department. Um, it would be X number of minutes on the average. But if we were able to actually track it for a while even, then we could take the total number that we did each day for each of those departments and we would have a much better feel of what it, the actual cost would be if it takes two and a half minutes? Because today we don't really know, right? I mean, we could guess. I'm sure you'd probably even come fairly close. So Department. I guess that's my point is that it might not be used all of the time. It might be something you do just initially to quantify how long it takes to do all these individual things that you're talking about for all these different departments and then use that as a multiplier times the number of parking tickets that you do each day or each month or each year. So. That's, I, I guess that's kind of the route I'm thinking, is that maybe you wouldn't do this every day, all year, every year, but that you would do it maybe in the first year so that we had a much better feel, a much, much better feel of uh, the cost. How do you, what, what do you think of that? Honestly, my, I cringe, because <laughs> it will slow down our productivity and our efficiencies um, by doing that when, when I think, um, I'll just say when we did the priority-based budgeting stuff, we had to kind of allocate our FTEs, and that was all based on estimates, and we asked people how much time do you think you spend on each of these different programs that we outlined. I think if we asked the people, um, they would have somewhat of an idea, and if they don't, maybe their supervisor does kind of thing without actually sitting down and tracking each individual invoice or purchase order or receipt or parking ticket. Um, yeah, it, for as much as we process in a day, it would really slow us down. Well, and, and I agree with you. I think initially it would be. 
I'm just thinking long term for your department, not not short term, because this is something I used to do in process improvement, and it can be wildly different, say processing a loan, if you will, a loan processor thinks, well, it takes me usually six minutes to do this particular form. And then when we actually timed it, because that's what we would do in this process improvement, um, it would be completely different. It would be like two and a half minutes. And they would say, well, I think it's at least six or seven. I mean, that's a very big difference. I mean, it's three or four times different. So um, I'm just, I just wanted to bounce that off of you because I know your area as well as the city attorney's office has a large part of the interdepartmental charges. So... I appreciate your input. Thank you. I guess my, my only final comment on that is, again, we're different than the attorney's office mm -hmm. um, in that they don't have customers coming in constantly. They're working on specific projects, whether it's for my department or public works or the airport or the civic center, um, and they can kind of block out their time a little bit better than what we can. Um, the nature of our business and the amount of purchase orders and invoices that we go through in a day, in a week, in a year, um, so are, are so astronomical. I mean, no other business. We're a $156 million business this year, and to be able to quantify that in time on an individual invoice or receipt basis is, is pretty astronomical. Mm -hmm. No, agreed. Thank you. We'll now go to Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple of questions for Pauline again. Um, I'm, I, again, I'm looking at the uh, final budget item, and let's see if it'll tell me what page I'm on, 57. And uh, again, I'm looking at the highlighted red items on there. One of the major ones for me is the uh, reduction in salary and wages. What is causing that? Um, looks like a reduction of about 42,000, either 30,000 or 42,000. And I'm trying to f decipher which line that's coming from. But uh, anyway, there's a reduction there. Correct. Uh, that's that, that FTE position that I have open that, yes. I was, uh, that I was hoping to fill next year, but I have agreed to hold off again for hold another off year. Again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then. Um, the other two items that I'm looking at are pretty insignificant, so um, I'll yield there. Thank you. There we go. All right, we will now move on to the fire department, and we'll go to uh, Rod Seals. Rod, do you have any opening remarks for us? Uh, sure. A little bit about um, our budget, because it is unique, because it wraps enterprise fund and general tax fund. Uh, really, there's four main areas. Uh, in the fire department budget. Um, we have our general fund um, budget. We have our inter enterprise fund budget, which is our ambulance. We have our fire and life safety division. And then within that fire and life safety division, there's also our hazard mitigation fund, which is for the uh, fuel removal in the wild and urban setting. Okay. And Rod, you were mentioning to me right before the meeting that we that um, you had a, a guest with us tonight to discuss uh, one and of I the items. I think we can probably, I'll, I'll cover that one as soon as you guys are done with the questions. I think After questions? Specific okay. Here. Uh, one thing I'd like to note on, um, on our fire department, on the general tax fund, um, in our 2017 budget, once it was approved, um, we added the seven firefighters that were previously assigned to the airport budget, and we added them after that, um, after the budget was approved. So the number you see as far as the 2017 budget um, actually is an increase, uh, the revised number on that is, uh, is, and I'm speaking specifically on the general fund, is 10,000, or 10,799,772. And so uh, what that affects is when you look at our overall increase, uh, as you see it there on uh, page FD3 of a million dollars and 675, uh, when you factor in the revised budget, it's actually about 541,000. So it takes our increase overall down to three and a half percent versus the 6.73 percent you see there. And that's kind of unique because it was done after the, the budget was approved. And then in, in addition to that, there's uh, two revenue streams that come back to the general fund uh, based on, on this, and that's uh, the SAFER grant, if you'll remember, 
The SAFER grant will run all the way through all of 2018, and that's paying the salary, wages, and benefits of nine firefighters, um, as well as the agreement we have with the airport. Uh, we bill them monthly for the services we provide out there for the aircraft rescue firefighting, um, and that's to the tune of about 550,000 a year as well. And the SAFER grant's about 600,000 uh, coming in next year. Okay. Stand by for questions. We'll begin with Alderman Lorenzi. Thank you, Chair. Chief Seals. Yes. My question for you has to do with uh, a discussion we had a few years ago. I'm sure you remember um, with the Southeast Corridor. Um, I think we, at one time, we were discussing another station in some cooperation with WDT. Is that? Does that ring a bell for you? Right. What, what happened on the location at Western Dakota, um, there was originally in the plans to put a working fire station next to their public safety building that they did all the additions out there. And what we ran into uh, real quickly was a water table issue. And so where the public safety building was going to go for, on, for Western Dakota that houses the police and, and fire science programs had to be moved quite a bit back up to the north. And so really... Uh, when we and and the fire station was going to be on a lower level even than that and so with the water table issues we ran into there uh, we really it wasn't a suitable location to build um, you know we have the center for public safety management study that we're going to see uh, here real quickly uh, as far as the draft final uh, it's supposed to be a week from tomorrow in, in our hands um, and I think part of that study was to take a look at our station locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think it's going to be interesting to see what that comes up with. Um, and so more to come on that, I guess. So has that corridor from previous studies been typically the longest uh, response times because of the geographic position of the current stations? You know, I, that is one, one area of town. I'm also in the southwest part of town, uh, out in Red Rocks area. That is also another area that is a long ways from either Station 5 or Station 6. So that's where, uh, you know, when we were looking at moving southeast, that really wasn't um, as bad as it is now. And as if there's any additional expansion to that area of town as far as um, pushing the city limits out further, which could happen. Um, you know, that's going to even make those times, those response times worse. So, again, I think that's all going to be included in the study, and I think I really look forward to seeing that. Good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. Thank you. Okay. We will now go to Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. appreciate it. Um, Chief Seals, have you got uh, employees out on other fires such as out-of-state we do. We have about nine firefighters out of state. Uh, uh, we have them right now in Washington State and Montana, are mainly the two states that they're, they're in. There's no plans to end that program? No, that program, a little bit about that program is uh, we, we have a wild end. Our contract is through the state of South Dakota Department of Ag, and that's our portal to the feds. And so we're part of the whole wildland response system that happens in our nation. And, uh, and really, that's even moved to an all-risk model. So it's not just wildland fires they go on. That is the main thing they do go on. But in that agreement um, is that we are reimbursed uh, for all of the cost incurred by sending those. So not only does the city get all that money back that we incur by sending that out, also for our equipment, we charge, for example, a brush truck, which is a typical pickup type uh, brush truck. It's called a Type 6. Uh, those uh, gain $65 an hour when they're on the fire line. Um, and so there is uh, revenue that is generated from that, uh, from those deployments. And, and really the, the other good thing it gets is it gets our people out on these really large wildland events or other stuff, but mostly, again, wildland. And so the experience they gain by going on those large fires, so when, when things go wrong here, for an example, the M. Hill fire last summer, uh, we have the people in place on our staff that are able to handle those large events real quickly. Thank you. And one more uh, qu question right now is to do with the, uh, the the life safety group that you have up on top of the hill, Station Six. They're in the they're in the lower level of Station Six. That's our fire and life safety, formerly known as fire prevention, but we changed the name uh, several years ago to be more reflection on what it is they do. One of the things that I appreciate about that department is that uh, they, they are doing some good things up there and, and with throughout the city. But my question has to do with 
maybe I'm touching on a sensitive subject here, but their, their, their working environment seems to be very, very close. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's going to be any accommodation for that in the future. Absolutely. So um, as you guys are aware, the goal for uh, rebuilding of Station 1, uh, that includes bringing the Fire and Life Safety Division back under one roof with us all. And so the preliminary plans that we've worked uh, on the Station 1 conceptual plan certainly includes the room to bring them uh, under one roof with all of us. I think I've got one more question, but at the moment there, if I may yield for the moment, and thank you. We'll now go to Alderwoman Drew. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have a couple of questions for Chief Seals, if I may. Absolutely. Okay. Um, now, I think a few years ago that we um, upped the wages for the fire department is and with the hope that, that we'd be able to retain people after we put in the money to train them. Now, is that getting better? Have we seen any fruit from actually paying more? Are we keeping people longer? So those wage increases took place January 1st of this year uh, for the starting wages. And so um, we certainly, you know, we just made eight job offers. Those folks are going to start October 1st. Um, and. Um, and then we, we, test, we test for a two-year list every other year in the even number of years. So next spring is that next test. And I think that's where that'll be the first glimpse that we're going to see as far as what are the numbers of numbers of people trying to test for our department. Uh, I think that's where we might, might see that. Um, as far as retention, um, we have lost a, a couple folks to, you know, that the grass is always greener on the other side. And, and so that uh, always happens. But... Uh, it, it certainly hasn't increased. So, okay. you know, so I, I don't know if it's something we can attribute to the wages at this point, but it, I think next year is going to give us a better picture of that. Well, it certainly doesn't hurt when you're offering a little bit more money. <clears throat> also, on your ambulance fees on our um, enterprise fund there, you know, um, I, I see that you do a lot of work in the community, of course, and helping people with the <laughs> ambulance response. Um, are their fees always paid? I mean, how are they paid? Through insurance, through individuals? What, what happens there? Uh, so all of the above. Obviously, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Indian Health Services, um, insurance, and private pay. And so there's a combination of all of that. And if you'll remember, just a couple weeks ago at a meeting, there was an am uncollectible ambulance write-off. And so I think that answers your question is, are we able to collect them all? No, we're not. Um, I will brag a little bit that we do all of our, our billing in-house. Um, and I think because of the, the dedication of the staff we have that, that does the billing and also the collections of that, um, that our collection rates are much higher than the national average. Um, but okay. if your next question is what are they, then I would throw a question back because it's how you look at it. Um, you know, when we do a, a uh, call that's a Medicare patient, uh, Medicare just has a set limit that they pay on that and you cannot balance bill, meaning you can't go uh, for the patient for the rest of that. So if your normal fee is $1,000 and they pay 500, I ask you, was that bill 50% collected or 100% collected? So you got to really look at those numbers as are you, are you, are you pulling out the uncollectible part of that or not, the mandatory write-offs. And so that's where when you ask people in the nation, well, what's your collections rates? You got to really ask a few more questions to understand that. Okay. I'm not going to ask any more questions. Thank you. I yield. <laughs> Thank you. We'll go back to Alderman Nordstrom. Yes, I remember what my question was going to be. Um, the uh, cost savings, If uh, I assume there is some cost savings by using, I believe you call it Medic One. It's the vehicle that you used instead of ambulances to go it, out. It's on actually, well, we have uh, two things there. We yes. have the mobile medic program, I think is what you're referring to. Yes, yes. And so what that is, is one person in a small SUV and on the uh, lower acuity type calls, so maybe it's just classified as a sick person. They're not having chest pain, they're not having breathing difficulty, but it, they're just sick. Um, so instead of sending a, a lights and siren or even a full response with an ambulance with two, we're able to do a lot of that stuff with the mobile medic program where they can get there. And then a lot, you know, a lot of times whether it's, uh, maybe they're just out of their prescriptions, maybe it is that they don't have the uh, transportation to get to fill their prescriptions, uh, we have taxi vouchers that we hand out, and so they're able to use that taxi voucher to take care of that, or maybe they just need to go to uh, a doctor versus the ER. And so that program is going to continue to grow as we're able to 
um, convince the South Dakota Board of Osteopaths that uh, as we move that model more to towards a community paramedic uh, model, which a lot of states in the nation have a full community paramedic program, and some of them uh, around us have even advanced that to where they're putting uh, PAs and nurses on those type of rigs, and they're actually able to do sutures in the field, uh, they're able to uh, do uh, field medications, write prescriptions, that type of thing. We're a long ways from that, um, but certainly there's a lot of models around us that are moving towards that just to take more and more pressure off the emergency rooms that people are using as their tertiary care. And, and again, maybe I'm touching on an, another s sensitive subject, but uh, the other area that I'm keenly aware of in your department are the uh, medical operations is the, uh, I, I believe that, I, I could be wrong on this term, but uh, the people that frequently use your services but not reimburse, since we have an opportunity, I'd like to hear uh, how that works or doesn't work properly uh, is because of the insurance. And right. Well, certainly we don't turn down anybody that needs a, to go to the hospital or is requesting to go to the hospital. Um, so certainly we have our frequent flyers, uh, as any service does like this. Uh, that's where, where one thing, the mobile medic program has been a really key part of working with other agencies in, in town to identify those people and whether it's mental health issues, wh whatever the issues are, we can really make sure that Department of Social Services or whomever is able to provide the follow-up that's needed and so it's really opened up a lot of conversations amongst all of us, uh, all the agencies that provide the service and, and it, it, interestingly enough, and this shouldn't be too shocking, our frequent flyers were often their frequent flyers. And so it really is able to identify those people and get them the help they need um, so they're not so reliant on the 911 system. And, and the issue primarily is the, the uh, cost recovery, that it's going to the patient, correct? And not to you, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, I think what you're discussing is, uh, is uh, some of the way the uh, insurance works or even yes. Medicare, that instead of reimbursing us directly, they will send the, uh, the amount to the patient and then it's the patient's responsibility to obviously send it to us. Um, there are some that, that probably do uh, maybe not pay us and they, they've received the money, uh, but again, there's nothing legally that we can go after the, other than through collections. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I'll yield. Okay, Chief, you have another item that you need to bring up, is that correct? Uh, yes, um, so this deals with the uh, Rapid City Pennington County Emergency Management. And so um, in the budget request from EM, which is always kind of cycled through the fire department, um, when there was um, a request for uh, reductions from the mayor on that, um, I was visiting with, uh, with Dustin Willett, the uh, director for emergency management, and um, the cut reduction was for $32,000. He said that he'd be able to cut 32,000 of his original request out. Um, and what he meant by that was 32,000 total because the way emergency management is funded, it, and it's funded 50% uh, by the city and 50% by the county, and that's by, by law. And so what um, I inadvertently did is told the mayor he's, that Dustin can handle a $32,000 reduction in that. And so that would mean it would be a $64,000 reduction, and he meant 32 total, 16 from the city and 16 from the county. And so I know uh, Dustin's here and he can answer any questions further than that. I know he went back and sharpened his pencil further, and instead of looking for a $16,000 increase, it would be 14,500. Okay, so you need a $14,500 increase from this proposed budget to meet our requirements for the emergency management program. Okay. <coughs> any questions for the chief or for Mr. Willett back there, he's here? I think we are aware of the situation. Thank you, Chief. Uh, before we get on to the mayor's items, uh, just a note for the city council, and under community resources, that also included human resources and the IT uh, department. Do any of you have any questions for either of those groups? Um, that we have representatives here, and I didn't know if we needed to keep them on the line or not, or if we were good. No? Okay, you're free to go, thank you. Moving on to the mayor's office, um, and Mayor Allender is here. Mr. Mayor, do you have any opening remarks regarding the mayor's office budget itself? 
Uh, the only remark that I have is that there's a, oh, a 32 or so thousand, $33,000 uh, addition in insurance in the mayor's office, but there's a corresponding thirty-two or three thousand dollar decrease under the city council. It was just moved from under the city council to the mayor's office, so don't be thrown off by that. Also, um, oh, and uh, for 2018, we are reducing our uh, budget by one part-time staff, so that we uh, will have. Um, just the uh, three full-time employees, including myself, in the office. Okay. okay. Any questions regarding the department of the mayor's office? Okay. If not, moving on to parks and recreation, we have Department Director Jeff Beegler here. Mr. Beegler, if you want to take the podium. And do you have any opening remarks or summary statements for us? Well, I just want to uh, point out that we do have a, a, a few budget reductions for 2018, and I can point those out to you uh, quickly. Uh, we are proposing reducing our professional services line item in our parks uh, budget uh, by $66,000. That is uh, uh, a custodial contract that we have that uh, cleans our park restrooms and uh, picnic shelters, as well as our uh, office buildings. And uh, we're proposing to uh, whittle that down and still have a contractor uh, do the cleaning of our uh, offices, but uh, handle all of the park custodial in-house with existing staff. Uh, we also have uh, a reduction uh, in a few other accounts. We're proposing to uh, go from a printed um, uh, program guide that we issue three times a year and instead putting that all online available for the community to reach in that manner that will save us uh, about eight thousand uh, dollars one of the big one of the increases that you'll see is in the uh, cemetery budget where we are proposing uh, an increase to the temporary uh, salaries uh, to bring in additional uh, seasonal laborers during the summer so we can uh, continue to maintain the cemetery further into the the, uh, the later part of the summer uh, in the past, when that uh, budget uh, was uh, part of the Enterprise Fund, uh, we were operating very, very bare bones to try to minimize the amount of, uh, of uh, general fund subsidy at the end of the year. So we would uh, uh, really button things up about this time of the year when our staff started going back to school. Uh, this uh, addition would allow us to maintain uh, additional staff further into the summer for uh, a better look to the cemetery. Uh, that cemetery budget is also uh, requesting uh, some funds for the beginning of a replacement cycle for aging equipment. Uh, again, that's, there's a number of pieces of equipment there that uh, date back quite a ways. A lot of it was uh, hand-me-down equipment from the Parks Department, and uh, it's really showing its age. And so that is one of the, the other increases that we'd like to see. Stand by, please, for mm -hmm. any questions. And council members have questions we go to Alderman Lorenzi thank you chair Jeff I guess that the main things for me and I think I briefly brought it up I don't know if you were here Tuesday night but I, I watched it okay very good so you're you're prepared I'm sure I hope <laughs> <laughs> my questions are about some of the things that you've alluded to already in your comments which is the cemetery, my concerns are the cemetery and the golf course, of course, moving to the general fund. Um, what do you feel about that? Do you feel that that is going to improve the operation of those? I'm, I'm trying to, I need somebody to explain to me why there's an advantage of moving them from an enterprise fund to the general fund. And if you could give me some of your feeling on that well and uh, taking the cemetery first of all I think the advantage is uh, not having to uh, work within the the constraints of uh, of, of the enterprise fund or where, where uh, we were hampered by the amount of, of revenue that comes in on a, an annual basis to the cemetery this would allow us to 
like I mentioned, perhaps increase our staffing levels, increase our uh, equipment or update our equipment uh, to operate uh, a little more efficiently and to also present a better product to the, the public. So uh, isn't that something, I'm sorry. Oh, no, right. Okay. Is that not something we could have done as an enterprise fund? Uh, we could have done that as an enterprise fund, yes. It would be just uh, an additional uh, general fund subsidy at the end of the year. Is there, but our, see, this is, this is the crux of my problem, is that we're moving it to, we're wanting to move it to the general fund so that we can, so that we can say that there's no longer a subsidy for it. And what I'm only, mainly concerned about is the fact that we aren't charging enough to cover the costs of the cemetery. And so what I want to know is, because now this puts a greater strain on property taxes and sales tax revenues. And so what I want to, what I want to do, and I want to make sure my colleagues understand this, is that when it was an enterprise fund, we were able to easily measure whether it was paying for itself or not. And the fees that were charged to provide the services for the cemetery and the golf course, because that's where I'm going next, is to pay for itself. And that puts that pressure on those operations to do that. And that puts pressure on studying and making sure, and we've had this conversation many times, about making sure that the fees that provide those services at both of those enterprise funds today um, pay for themselves. So where are we at, at at defining and adjusting those fees so that that happens? Because if if we aren't doing anything to do that, I'm going to be lobbying very hard to make sure that these stay as enterprise funds. And I just want my colleagues to understand so that we are not putting more pressure on the taxpayers and the general fund to subsidize these because we have been subsidizing them. My understanding is last this last year we, we did not. But that doesn't mean this next year that, uh, you know, if we have a lot of rain and we don't get a lot of golfers, mm -hmm. guess what's going to happen? The general fund's going to be subsidizing it again. So I want to try to minimize that by making sure that we increase the costs of the services provided by these current enterprise funds. So where are we at with that? Well, we did a, a uh, kind of a survey. Of, we'll take the cemetery, first of all, of uh, where we are in terms of, uh, of charging fees, um, as it relates to other cemeteries in the area. And uh, we've got, uh, uh, generally we are charging the most currently uh, in the West River area. We aren't charging as much as the Sioux Falls or into uh, Minnesota, but we are um, the highest rate of the cemeteries West River. But will they pay for themselves? Not at those fees, no. So what keeps us from raising those fees? Uh, well, I guess just the will to, to do that. Uh, this, you know, that's, they're, they're at a rate now that uh, um, they're, they're high uh, if, if you're, you're in need. Um, could they be higher? Sure they could be higher, um, but that is going to be an additional strain on Do you think that they should pay for themselves? Personally, I do not in terms of the cemetery. I think that is something that uh, uh, a municipal cemetery is something like a, a municipal park in, in that it, uh, is, it, it provides a, 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 a something for the community and it provides a benefit for the residents that... Uh, How do you feel about privatizing such an operation? Um, I, I don't have an issue with privatizing. I think that that's a very difficult thing. I know I've, I've been in other areas where that has taken place and it, it hasn't always resulted in a better deal for the community. The golf course. Golf course, we raised our fees this last year uh, for 2017, 10% uh, from the year before. Uh, we um, are cutting our expenses for 2018 in the golf course budgets. And uh, we have traditionally uh, operated with a um, a rate of return of 90 to 94 percent, meaning that our revenues have been coming back and, and covering about that percentage of the expenses. That's really not, not bad at all when you consider 
other uh, recreational opportunities that have a, a larger subsidy. Uh, I know that there's an, some, uh, some folks feel that perhaps golf is something that is not a, a community benefit and maybe benefits only uh, upper income individuals, but uh, it's something that we've been uh, striving to uh, get more young people, get more families uh, involved in the game of golf, and so we've been putting efforts into that uh, and so I do feel that uh, there probably is still room for increasing fees at the golf course a bit. Is there projected increases for this next year? We have not uh, finalized that yet. We usually get together in October or thereabouts and take a look at it and what the market we think the market. Do you will think there will be increases? I th I do believe there will be in some of the categories. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll now go to Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jeff, you'll have to help me on the old memory banks here, is the Robbinsdale Park. Yes. Is, is that in your budget, the Robbinsdale Master Plan was uh, committed to? We're starting to work on that project, but I was looking for a line item on it, and sorry, I haven't uh, been able to find it. The uh, That's a CIP project? It is totally CIP. It, yes, the master plan is completed, and so the uh, funds for construction of that are uh, CIP funds. Thank you. And then uh, uh, just one other comment uh, is that the uh, Mount Rushmore Road, that is going to be undertaken by y your department as well, the, the, uh, the boulevard down the center? That's correct. And, and am I still correct on, the, and again, that's another one that I couldn't find in here, but if you're going to be undertaking that, um, have you got a cost estimate what that is going to be? Uh, no, I don't have a cost estimate on that. Uh, we've started maintaining phase one of that project, and phase two has been, the uh, landscaping has been installed in phase two, but it's still being uh, maintained by the contractor, the installation contractor. Uh, we will be taking that over uh, in the spring, and then uh, phase three will be assuming that as well, but I do not have a cost for that. And I'm going to be asking a very sensitive question here about uh, swimming pools. We are subsidizing them, correct? Yes. Can you tell us approximately how much or percentage or? Um, well, let's see here. We do have a subsidy of, of them. Uh, if you want a per swimmer subsidy or just a dollar figure, I can, uh, I can give you uh, either of those. Um, if I can find it, that is. Sorry to cut you off guard on that. But no, no, uh, that's all right. I, I've got a lot of information here, but uh, I just need to locate it. Oh, here we go. And I'm not, while you're looking that up, Jeff, I'm not advocating uh, reduce or take away the subsidies on it. I just re need a reminder on what the... Uh, what the uh, su subsidy amount is? Well, we have a subsidy to the Sioux Park pool of uh, about $69,000, a subsidy to the Parkview uh, pool of 94000 Horace Mann, 140000 and uh, the Swim Center, about uh, 864000 Which equals, have you got a total there? I do not. Hey, it, it equals I'll, I'll get those numbers from you yeah. later. And then sure. Then, uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yield. Uh, we'll go to Alderwoman Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and so, Jeff, since we're along those lines also, and you did um, separate out the pools, and I wasn't sure if all the pools were pulled together or if they were separate, so um, it's nice to know that you've got the separate pools. Do you offset those subsidies, as you said, by swimmers for the, the daily count of who shows up at those different pools? Um, you offered up a subsidy per. Well, yes. Well, that is the uh, the shortfall that's in each of those individual uh, budgets. Correct. Okay. Um, what about the ice arena? Uh, the ice arena has a uh, subsidy of uh, well, this is 2016 numbers of around three hundred nine thousand dollars. Okay. 
And Jeff, have you looked at a study on like the pools and the ice arena? Is it kind of like the cemeteries where you've compared the prices to other municipal pools or private pools or whatever else and really the market can't bear any increased dollars? Uh, we do look at that, yes. That is something that we, we do take a look at. We also look at, uh, at industry uh, standards for rates of return for those various things. There's, there's a, um, a national rate of return for uh, ice arenas, for instance, that's uh, in the 50 to 55 percent uh, rate. Uh, we've got rates of return in, in aquatics that are generally generally around 50 percent, meaning that typically uh, the uh, uh, revenue that comes in covers about that 50 percent of the expenses on those those items. That's what I was going to ask you. Yes. So so even though the breakdown for Sioux, Sioux Parkview, Horace Mann, and then the swim center that would be Roosevelt, wouldn't it? The swim yes, center. Yes, correct. correct. Um, so when you're mentioning those different uh, dollar amounts that are being subsidized yep. is that roughly half of what the cost is to operate those different pools um, roughly okay yeah. so it's right around that 50 percent correct the last question I had on on this is so when we're talking about fees and you set the fee schedules for the pools and for the ice arenas um, and golf mm -hmm. and you know all of these is there a separate fee for city employees uh, we do have a city employee wellness program, and if people, uh, city employees want to participate in that, they can, uh, can do so uh, by coming to our office and filling out the necessary paperwork. Uh, it results in about a 50% savings if they want to buy a season pass, for instance, um, and it's part of the, the city's wellness program. Okay. And you said it was about a 50 percent, five zero percent reduction on the fees. Correct. But is that? that oh, I'm sorry. That, I, I was just going to add that that's that's only for those that participate in the program, and we don't have a. You go to the pool, show your ID, and, and get get in for a reduced rate. That's part of the wellness program that people have to sign up for. Okay, and and when they sign up for that, um, if it, it's either taken out of their paycheck or they have to pay for the price right up front, I mean, it's kind of an investment in their wellness. Correct. It correct. Be, if I remember can, correctly. Yep, it can be handled either way. Okay, and um, so then um, uh, some people or some citizens think that there's a separate program for city retirees. Is there a separate fee structure, or can retired city employees participate in the wellness program? Ooh, uh, there is not a separate program, no. So retirees. it is just city employees that Correct. can participate in the wellness program. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield. You bet. Thank you. And you know, wellness programs are good because mm -hmm. if you can have well, good wellness programs, helps keep those health insurance uh, costs at least somewhat at bay, if, if at all possible. Uh, we're now going to go to Alderman Roberts. Because of the wind. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff, I'm going to kind of go down the line that uh, Mr. Lorente went down as far as the uh, moving the cemeteries and the golf courses uh, into the general fund. Now, the cemetery doesn't bother me that much because eventually it's going to have to go into the general fund anyway because once it's full, you know, to maintain it for perpetuity, it's going to have to go in the general fund. And cemeteries, unfortunately, almost everywhere are supported a little bit by you know, the community's general fund. The golf course, though, worries me. Um, as an avid golfer many years ago and having played many, many, probably thousands of rounds out at Meadow, Meadowbrook, um, I have nothing against the golf course, but I do have an issue with shifting that over into the general fund because it worries me if we shift it into the general fund, there's not going to be as much oversight into it. and. You know, the reason that it was set up the way it was was so the users would be paying for it. Mm -hmm. And now we shift it over to the general fund and the people that not necessarily are golfers could be paying for it. And that, that worries me a little bit. And the oversight worries me a little bit. Um, you know, on the other end, you know, if they ever do make a little bit of money, it goes into the general fund that way. But uh, I don't think that it will offset as much as, you know, I just look back at my years on the council so far and the times that we had to, you know, 
to give money out of the general fund for the golf course. Right. Um, and I do appreciate the things that you're doing, like increasing, you know, the fees and, and working on cutting some of the costs, because I think that, you know, that's just good management practices. But, you know, I just, I'm like Mr. Lorente. I want to see how we're going to track this once it's into the general fund. And that's what worries me for right now is, is you know, as long as it's where it is now, it's fairly simple to track. You know, I, and I'm sure it's more work for you and more work for the Parks Department. Well, it, it'll, it'll be able, we'll be able to track it the same way. I mean, it'll still have its, its separate cost centers. It'll still have uh, up here as a separate budget. And the uh, revenues that come in from it will still be golf course revenues. So we will be able to still track both expenses and yeah. revenues. Okay, well, maybe it'll be harder for us to track it. Then. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be asking more questions sure. on that. But I, I do want to go over to, real quick, I want to go, go over to urban forestry. Um, it's my recollect, recollection, and, and I may be wrong on this, but back in, in 13 or 15 or whenever that we, we switched over the $300,000 for pine me beetle mitigation into urban forestry, mm -hmm. <laughs> that money, when it went over there, it was my rec recognition that when the pine beetle epidemic was over, that money was going to be pulled back out. And I see that this department has absorbed that money and even created more of a department after the fact. But I, I, looking through, through some of the line items, in 2000, between the 2016 actual and the 2018 that's being asked for, I see that uh, the salaries have doubled. So I imagine you've added a few people to that, that oh, department. Actually, actually, we've just uh, kind of done a better job of accounting for the full-time people that were being paid for out of the parks uh, 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 budget before. Okay. And, and uh, instead of uh, attributing a percentage of employee A's time and employee B's time, we've now uh, put it uh, a little more accurately as to who is actually uh, working, uh, doing the tree work. So that's okay. just been something that has been uh, kind of uh, cleaning up of, of uh, how those uh, costs and expenses are, are accounted for. Well, one of your budgeted line items that I see is for uh, machinery and automated equipment. And in comparison to the, to the budget, your total budget's 578000 or the mayor's asking for. But that line item alone is 110000 every year. For a department that small, that's an awful big line item budget. It is. So can you tell me what that's for? I certainly can, yes. Uh, this last year, 2017, we, uh, we purchased a large uh, brush chipper, something that we didn't have. We had an old beat up one that we'd had for years and years and years. And so we, that's what we purchased out of the 2017. Uh, the 2018 uh, uh, request is for a chipper truck to pull that item. Right now we are pulling it with uh, a dump truck, which works. But it's not ideal, and it's not uh, uh, really particularly good for either piece of equipment to be not using the proper equipment. So this, uh, this request is for a chip truck that's got a big chip box on the back of it so that all of the debris that's fed through the chipper goes into the box. <coughs> I, thank you for clarifying that for me. Ideally, I, drive, I would drive a brand new Cadillac, but I can't afford it. So I... I'm just, I was just kind of looking at this, this one department and looking at how much it's increased over the last few years. And it's just hard for me to, to justify a purchase that big and a budget that's that small. So anyway, thank you, Jeff. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. So now I'll go to Alderwoman Drew. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just to indulge me for just a moment here. You're in charge of the fountains in, in the city, is that correct? Uh, some of them, yes. Some of them, okay. Who's in charge of the um, Lion's Head Fountain on the corner of 7th and Main? Uh, that is, uh, I'm, I think the Downtown Association. Okay. I've noticed it hasn't been running for quite some oh, time, and yeah. it was restored by uh, School of Mine sure. students, and I'm kind of concerned about that. Yeah, that's so. that old horse trough. 
Uh, yeah, so I'll take it up with the Downtown Association. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, Mr. Beagler, if you don't mind, I, have we ever considered, uh, or maybe you, you have, outsourcing certain services that you do in the parks, for example? Have you ever done a cost comparison between lawn services using a landscaping company versus having our own city staff that we pay and give benefits to? Uh, I don't think there's been a serious uh, comparison of that uh, over the years. I know it's something that we've talked about. It's something that uh, in previous jobs uh, we looked at and, and actually did mm -hmm. in a couple of instances. Uh, that is something that could be looked at, yes. I know that when we did look at that for the, uh, the cemetery maintenance, and uh, because it's so specialized and because there, it's so labor intensive uh, with uh, cutting all around uh, all of the, the headstones, that we really didn't get any anybody that was even interested in submitting a, a, a quote. Okay, something I've always wondered. And also on, on the cemetery, the golf is a different discussion. I, I do understand the concerns from my colleagues about watching that budget, but the cemetery, you can price that so high that you want to cover the cost, but nobody will use it and you make no money because there's principles of economics at play where, yeah, we can jack up the price all we want, but they'll just go somewhere else. And guess what? We have no budget to work with whatsoever. We still have a cemetery regardless. We can't just dump it. So uh, just keep those kinds of things in mind as, as we do want to cover as many costs as we can. But certain things, you just you will price yourself out of business, and, and that's just a business 101. So I think uh, oh, looks like we still have another thing from Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You reminded me of something here. Um, uh, yeah, Mr. Bigler, uh, um, remind me what we're doing with, uh, I believe it, the title was called Landscape Architect. Or what are we doing with that position? Uh, that's a position that was vacated uh, just about a month ago. Yes. Uh, we are, our, our department is uh, under a 60-day hiring moratorium, so we'll be advertising for that position uh, later on in September. Thank you. Yield. Okay, uh, let's move on to the police department and we have uh, Chief Carl Jagaris with us today. Uh, Chief, do you have any uh, highlights you wanna share with us? Yes, just a few. Uh, first off, I'll just start by saying that we did not request any additional uh, staffing this budget year, uh, partially because we did have a significant increase the previous year, um, but I just wanted to throw out um, a note of caution that we can't continue to have no staff increases year after year. Um, we really need to make sure that in future years we continue to, at a minimum, keep up with the growth in the city. Um, our salary and wage increases reflect the recently approved contract with employees uh, that was approved by council recently. And I'll tell you that we strive to um, have no additional increase um, in our operational cost and we actually reduced our operational expense by $65,000 by reducing our fleet request. Um, the reason why we did so, just like all other departments, is it was made clear by the mayor that this was a belt tightening year that we were um, facing a tight budget condition. So um, then the only, the only other thing that um, is not currently included, and I would encourage you to include in this budget, is our program offer that we submitted a request for $100,000 to support a body camera program for our officers. If you recall, um, earlier this year, we sought permission from the council to apply for a grant through the Department of Justice jointly with the Pennington County Sheriff's Office. And we will learn if we're successful from that grant in October. It's, it requires a 50% match, which for each the sheriff's office and the police department would be $100,000. Um, so I think that that is an important thing that it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. I think the time is now. I think we're in a area that, that's one area that we as a department are not being progressive in. And especially now more than ever, um, the community expects transparency. It's been deemed to be a very useful tool for prosecution, which in the end that deters crime and it's a, it's a very good crime fighting tool. So $100,000 requested in addition to what the mayor's budget request is and I have a solution as to how you might be able to fund that and that is, as you know, we work collaboratively with the Pennington County Sheriff's Office on several projects and uh, we're very fortunate as a community to have that 
that that cohesive of a relationship because in the end what it results in is increased efficiencies for taxpayers so um, the sheriff is working a parallel process to get his budget approved as you know with the penny the county as we speak and as you know um, the city has partnered in an expansion to the detox program that will be relocated early next year uh, on kansas city street and so just today the sheriff was able to um, he uh, presented a memo to the commission uh, for his budget request and he reduced his budget request support from the city of rapid city for next year's detox program by hundred and two thousand five hundred and seventy three dollars so it was seven hundred and thirteen thousand and he's okay. just reduced that to six twenty nine three twenty one so regardless of what you want to do with with the body cam issue um, the mayor's proposed budget we just learned today that there is a reduction in need of a hundred and two thousand five hundred and seventy three dollars so um, that is not expected to change from from here and with that I'll just uh, stand for questions okay uh, chief while we wait for questions you said you just learned of that today so the mayor had no knowledge of the that that was coming I've spoken to the mayor today about it and also to the finance officer so yeah it is fresh information okay all right uh, go to Alderwoman Scott thank you mr. chair um, it's, so it's getting late and I'm not really quite sure that I was following along so there's a match between the city and the county and you just found out that the sheriff department got a reduction of hundred and two thousand dollars which means the city's budgeted portion for 2018 is reduced 102 i'm trying to follow this i should probably repeat it it's two separate issues okay. and so the issue is with the match for the department of justice grant for body worn cameras we still require a hundred thousand dollars for the next budget year actually for the next two budget years um, each year but so a hundred thousand dollars for the 2018 budget set that to the side unrelated to that but somewhat coincidental the Pennington County alcohol and drug program the detox program is jointly funded between city and county and the 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 proposed revenue that's needed for the county from the city to fund that in 2018 has been reduced by hundred and two thousand dollars okay and that it, so in the mayor's 2018 budget had he already budgeted that hundred and two thousand dollars that's kind of where I was going with that yes it's in the current budget that you have as one of the supplemental items subsidies so you're suggesting that the the revenue stream or the revenue portionment for the body camera for 2018 could just simply be that line item adjustment from the amount that uh, the city should pay for the joint effort for the detox center over to the partnered body cam right and that would be to uh, police miscellaneous supplies and materials okay that's what I thought you said but I wanted to make sure that I understood that so thank you I yield thank you and now go to Alderman Roberts thank you very much I got a question for Pauline real quick um, I don't know if this was asked Tuesday night or not. I didn't go through everything that was asked, and I missed Tuesday night. How much undesignated cash are we going to have to work with this year that makes you feel comfortable? I believe when the mayor and I met, um, we were looking at about $1.5 at the absolute maximum, and that's um, relying on some of the departments to not spend this year's budget to get to that dollar amount. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, Chief, I just want you to know that uh, I definitely support this $100,000. This is an important program. I hope the rest of the council does too because I think that body cams are the wave of the future and we need to get on that board and we need to get it done. So thank you. Okay. Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, perhaps a question. Uh, a confirmation from the chief um, chief Jagger is uh, your total budget is 
roughly 15 and a half million? Correct. Thank you. Um, if I may direct another question to Pauline Sumption. Okay. Pauline, uh, I think you told us before, but would you remind me of the property tax collection that we're bringing in currently? Or if you've got a projected number? Let me get to the right page and I'll tell you what we project for 2018. For 2018, it would be 16 million 863 Thank you, and, it, and, and I think that's another reason why we need to take a look at all kinds of other resources uh, that we have available to us, because basically the uh, property taxes paying for uh, the, the bulk of property taxes that are going towards uh, police enforcement or police department and the uh, and if you want to look at it another way is that basically uh, half of this uh, property tax collection is going towards the uh, half of it going to the police department the other half going to the fire department with the remainder having to be picked up by all other fees and services so it, uh, I'm really wanting to take a look at the all the uh, fees that we we're collecting how that is being done so uh, we don't have to rely totally on, on, on uh, property tax because um, right now the way I'm looking at it is a two-legged stool and the one leg is pretty weak right now. So uh, totally support what is happening, what the budget is coming forward, but we need to take a look at that second stool, the leg of the stool for uh, uh, revenue, another revenue stream. Thank you. Yield. Alderman Lorenzi, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Chief, I just want to make sure that I, I want to ask a few questions about the camp body cameras. I understand the grant was not as large, is that correct, or we didn't get any of that? No, we applied for the grant earlier this spring, and at that time it required um, council approval to apply. Correct. We have not heard back and the timeline that was expected was October and so we're feeling confident that we have a very good opportunity and good justification especially um, in that we're collaborating with the sheriff's office to do so so um, there has been no no reduction it always required a 50 percent cost match okay so is there something are we able to phase um, this in or are we doing it in phases now, the, the program as it sits today? No, the intention would be we're in a re research and development phase, but when we implemented it, it would be implemented overall. Um, I think that that's the most, it's very important when we do this that we do it right. And if we're going to do a partial implementation, it's going to take away from the credibility of the program overall. Yeah, I, I, what I was thinking of, Chief, was implementing half of what we were looking for this year and the other half the following year. Definitely 100% implementation. It's just a matter of how long we take to get 100% implementation. So as far as the um, invoicing and the payment structure, we've already split that over two years. So 2018 okay. would be year one, and then 2019 would be a repeat. Okay, so this program is all encompassing. Do we have, well, that's a question really, but um, as far as the training and, and do, do they have personnel that are coming to, to do that, that's part of the program? We have a joint uh, team from, our, from the management of the Sheriff's Office and the Police Department working to uh, develop policy and protocol to do the research on the product acquisition and then also the management of the data once we implement it. So depending on the vendor that was chosen, um, would depend on if they actually came out and did boots on the ground training with us, but that'll be part of our um, implementation research. And we're, I'll commit to you that we're gonna do it right. We're, there's too much to lose to not do a very 
um, well-planned and well-executed implementation. All right, thank you. You know, it has my support. It did when we initially uh, talked about this particular subject, so I will be supporting it, but I, I, I must be honest with you. Um, this is an example, if you will, of what we argued for last year about an undesignated cash that departments would come forward and justify the need to spend into undesignated cash and I think that's going to be a conversation we're going to have here in the near future but um, this is an example if you will for the new people of what uh, um, Alderwoman Scott and I talked about last year about undesignated cash where the chief is coming to us granted it's during the budget cycle but this is a very good example of what would happen if we didn't spend undesignated cash up front in the budget, the police would come to us and say, we need this, and then we would identify the funding for it. In this particular case, it sounds like it may be undesignated cash, and we all understand the importance of this program, and so this is exactly how we could employ spending undesignated cash rather than doing it up front in the budget. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Chief, that is the last question for you. Um, question for the council, we're at the two hour mark. I uh, would like to know if you'd like to proceed at least through the remainder of the city department directors or whether uh, you want to end our session for the night. And so um, I guess maybe we go to a vote. Oh, we got questions. Alderwoman Scott. Uh, thank you. I, I'd like to make the motion that we at least finish out the review of the city departments tonight and then look to Schedule the next budget hearing. Okay, the motion on the floor is that we continue through the remainder of the city department de departments for this evening and the remainder of the, but the uh, agenda will continue on Monday night. Uh, do I have a second? Second by Laura Armstrong. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries, we'll continue the work. All right, uh, now on to the public library and it uh, looks like we've got representatives from the library. If you wanna come on up to the podium, introduce yourselves to the council. Good evening, mind. Terry Davis, director of the library. Um, my comments will be brief. I've been here all of four days. Welcome, Terry, by the thank, way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I have brought with me Sean Minkle, the assistant director, and any questions you may have that I don't have the background or perspective for, um, Sean should be able to address. Very good. Uh, council have any questions regarding the library budget? We do have Alderwoman Scott. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so first of all, welcome back, Terry, because I you. know that you worked at the library prior to your adventures Correct. outside of South Dakota. So welcome back to South Dakota and welcome back to Rapid City and welcome back to our library. Thank you. Um, Terry, and if, if you need to uh, call on assistance, but or you may remember, what is there a portion of the library's budget that the city is contractually obligated to provide? We do not have a contract with the city. We have a contract with the county. Uh, so the city's budget portion every year is based on whatever the mayor and the staff, library staff and the library board requests or because I know the library is run by a separate board. Correct, and that's statutorily defined, the board. Mm -hmm. So the board is statutorily defined. Mm -hmm. You do have a contract with the county to provide uh, funding for the services that the library uh, provides Correct. but what is there any obligation that the city is under when it comes to the budgetary side or is it simply up to the mayor and the staff and then finally the city council to determine what funding the city actually wants to contribute to the library that is essentially correct your your first comment about whatever we request or determine um, isn't quite there because, of course, um, I don't know that that uh, the library budget has ever matched uh, what the request has been. Um, and this year, for example, as you see, we have made a number of reductions um, through efficiencies and deferments of replacement costs, et cetera. Um, but yes, I believe that is essentially correct. All right, thank you. You're Yield. Welcome. Go to Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Terry, I know you've only been on the 
the head of this department for a very short period of time, but uh, the, uh, are you, have you gone through the efficiency committee report or study or review yet, just yet? I, I have not. I was familiar with um, the fact that it was coming on board. There was discussion of it, I believe, before I left. Um, and now we do have a report. I have not had a chance to review that in depth, no. Okay, that was my next question. Do you feel prepared for it? So the other question I have for you is, uh, um, is there any, currently, as you're standing there right now tonight, do you see any major changes that you see that upcoming? You know, we've got your budget and all of that items in, in there, but do you see any major changes or significant items that you want to reprioritize? It's early in the game for me yet. Um, right. I do tend to be very uh, data oriented and always uh, like to do the um, assessment of what works and what not, what doesn't essentially determine our return on investment, whether it's a service we provide, whether it's collections in the library, whether it's programs. And um, I have not had a chance to look at the data and the statistics. Okay. That's usually done a couple of times a year, but I have not had my hands on that as yet. Um, so it's a little early to say what might change. Sure. Uh, I know our programming is wildly successful. We had a, a group of kids in the library today doing all kinds of scientific uh, experiments and, and practices. Um, people come in the library, but you know, what, what specifics in there may alter, I, I couldn't say at this point. Fair, very fair, mm -hmm. very fair. What, what I'm interested in also is a better understanding of the makerspace as well. Sure. And, and one, of, one of the things that I'm curious about is how that fits into your priorities. And I, I understand you haven't got the data for it uh, uh, to understand or explain it to us, how that's going to fit into your priorities. But I, that's one area of interest for me. Uh, because for me, uh, uh, one of the things that's very strong and important is the education, mm -hmm. the education component that the library does. And I, I, if I understand makerspace, there is some opportunities for education to be involved in there. So I really want to come out and, and, and for myself saying that I support education and, and, and I, I believe your department is one of probably outside of the school system, probably the one or stronger components of education. So um, I, I'm really curious about what you've got for priorities, how that's going to change. So. Please uh, let us know as soon as possible, please. Well, thank you for that. Uh, libraries are certainly all about lifelong learning. Yes. And we do support learning no matter who is learning, no matter what they're learning. We try to bring enough resources to bear and provide enough information that people are, be, are able to meet their learning needs. Um, the makerspace is really all about the STEM learning, um, the science, technology, engineering, math. Um, so it is perhaps a combination of coding or circuitry or robotics. Um, we have the 3D printers, so there's coding for the printers, there's programming for the printers. Today, as I said, the kids were creating um, almost Rube Goldberg machines to, to move um, objects around the room and have a contest for that. So it's bringing that, that scientific and, and creativity to bear on problem solving. And that's really what the makerspace done. It's learning made fun. And it's engaged in by young kids, middle school aged kids, high school aged kids, and starting to get some adults in there. So uh, that's, that's all positive. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate your time. You're I'll welcome. yield. Now to Alderman Lorenzi. Thank you, Chair. Terry, thank you for being here tonight. My question for you, and it's one of my bugaboos when I'm looking at data or I'm looking at numbers, but especially expenditures, but other. Um, one of these is significant. It's a 22% increase uh, year over year, and it's $50,755. It's under other current expenses. Could you? expound on that a little bit for me? 
Oh, could you please help me out with the line item on that one? I'm not looking at the line item budget. I'm looking at the the summary. I don't know if somebody can uh, help me here if they're looking at that. I see. Yes. All right. Um, that is essentially the line item that includes our online databases for research. Um, so whether those are magazines that are online, uh, journals, um, encyclopedias, uh, consumer reports, um, auto repair, different online databases that we have. Um, it also includes our uh, computers, office furniture, any shelving that we need in the library, and also the replacement cycle for our computers. So was there a recent purchase then in that area? Is that the difference? I mean, is that the the, the twenty two thousand or the twenty two percent, the fifty one thousand uh, dollars? In earlier this year, the redesign and reconfiguration of the library was completed, and that did have um, new shelving components, and which some furniture, some small pieces of furniture okay. were in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I You're yield. Welcome. All right, go to Alderwoman Drew. Thank you. Just a, a comment more than a question. Um, I, I know you're newly back to Rapid City, and congratulations, and thank you for taking the position. Um, I served on the library board for my first three years in the council, and um, you continue to buck the trends nationally of um, a downtrend in um, library participation. We're instead seeing an uptick. So I think that we have to say thank you to your for your work and for this great resource you're providing for our city. Thank you. Thank you. That is the last of our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on to the Rapid City Regional Airport. Director uh, Patrick Dame is in attendance. Welcome, Patrick. Do you have any opening remarks for the City Council? Thank you, yes. Uh, I'm Patrick Dame. I'll have a few opening remarks here. Uh, the airport board uh, is, is governed by a five-member board uh, selected by the mayor and approved by the council. Uh, I do have Vice Chair uh, William Eldridge, Bill Eldridge with me. Uh, I also have uh, uh, our Finance and Administrative Director, Tony Broom, with me as well. Uh, the airport has had a very good year. Uh, we are currently running a third-year record year. Uh, so numbers are good, uh, our, our most recent numbers and our overall annual numbers. Uh, basically, you know, to look at how we deal with our capital and how we deal with our budget, a good majority of our, in, of our capital budget comes from the federal government. Uh, we typically get grants uh, for areas that are eligible. Uh, that would be runways, taxiways, uh, aircraft parking aprons, uh, things that are, are not necessarily revenue generating, we're able to get a 90-10 grant uh, on a lot of those items. Things that are revenue generating like parking lots and uh, portions of the terminal, uh, the car rental space, uh, those areas are not eligible for federal funding uh, or are prorated uh, as such. So when we looked at putting together our budget, a lot of our budget is based on trying to find areas where we can get some, gain some operational efficiencies, uh, but then also uh, make some improvements to the existing facility. Now when we put our budgets together, typically what we'll do is we have to have our board approve it several months in advance before it comes to the council. Uh, with that, we are, for our federal grants, tend to be in competition uh, basically region-wide uh, for the federal dollars that are out there. Sometimes you'll see our capital budgets will vary wildly based on the amount of capital that we put on the budget. Uh, in this case, we were hoping to get a discretionary grant on the terminal. We do know now that that's not going to come. We're going to continue to work on that through the years. So, you know, with that, our capital is a little stronger at this point than, uh, than it otherwise would be. Uh, we will be banking on what we consider our entitlement funds uh, which is based on our passenger load, we get a certain amount of entitlement dollars uh, that, that go into our capital development. So we are sticking our projects within and getting what projects we can get done uh, based on the grant that we receive from the federal government uh, in this next year. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I will take any questions. Thank you. Uh, to kick us off, we got Alderman Lorenzi. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Chair. I have a quick couple of questions for you, a couple of things that stood out for me. I, I, I have traveled a few times through the airport, and I think you guys are doing a great job. It's a wonderful Thank facility. 
Um, my question's for you, and you brought it up. You alluded to it on government grants. Significantly almost doubled uh, that particular budget. What accounts for that? Uh, so if you look at the government grants uh, in the portion of that that we, we put under for capital, what we were hoping to get was a project to uh, put in an inline baggage system. We've been doing the study on this uh, for the airline terminal for the back of house development. We've done a very good job as a community to develop the places that the fam that that you as a traveler get to see. It's it's a very nice development, and I, I credit all of you for getting that done. The places that we haven't worked on are the places where the people are working. The efficiencies for how baggage, baggage is processed, the efficiency on how they pick it up in the areas that they work in haven't been touched since the 80s. So we're working on trying to get a project through with that. However, when you start to look at terminal projects, most of those do not play well in a discretionary world. So trying to play them at a time when places like Bismarck is building a new runway, Williston's building a new airport, those projects don't play well. So with that, we did put, put together a terminal project that we hope to be able to get through and get funded. We're likely going to have to break it up over, over the next couple of years into smaller digestible doses uh, to be able to get it done likely with some entitlement funding. The next thing I had, thank you. The next thing I had was the additional parking revenue for lot improvement. Zero last year, $726,000. Can you expound a little bit on that? So with the lot improvements that we're looking at doing right now, uh, if you look at our exit plaza, uh, the current exit plaza right now is in pretty ill repair. And when, you know, as you're exiting from the, the parking lot there, that is the, the first impression of the community when you're coming out. So what I think is we need to make something that's representative of Rapid City, what's representative of the hills, and really get people uh, excited to get out in there. So what we've done is we're putting together a booth, an exit plaza. Uh, we're actually going to realign the exits to make things easier. Right now you currently have to make a right turn to get out of the parking lot. I like, you know, when people come to an airport, I, even myself, if I go to an airport, you know, it's, it can be confusing, and I work at one every day. So we want to make things as simple as possible. So part of that is, is to make the improvement, but to also simplify the movements for those people who are leaving the parking lot. Thank you. And I agree with you on that. I, I've recently uh, traversed that right turn. and It can be a little confusing, so the improvement there would be great. And then the last thing I have for you is going from zero to $210,000, the fuel tax revenue. If you can just explain that to me. I will have to get you an answer on that one. I okay. don't have, I do not have the answer for okay, that Okay, very good. Right I'll, I'll put that down and send you an email reminder on that one. Yep. I just want to understand that particular line item. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next up we have Alder Wolf and Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Patrick, you, you were, thank you, focusing on us, but I believe Tony may have that answer. If we could uh, see if Tony yeah. can shed some light on that yep. tonight and then you don't have to... Give it, give follow it a second follow-up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, money that we actually have on deposit with the state. It's fuel tax revenues that are collected, and the state holds those funds. We still have to apply for those when we want to use them. They usually are used to supplement our AIP projects. So we have money sitting in the bank, so to speak, with the state that we had built into the budget to use for next year. Those projects, you just gave me an acronym. Can you A something projects? AI, AIP Airport Improvement Program. Okay, very good. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for that information. No email from me, by the Perfect. way. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and if, if you can follow this up since I had the floor. Yeah. Just Thank you, Alderman Laurenti. <laughs> <laughs> I was following up on your question, but that's okay. So, Patrick, just to finish that out. Um, as Tony had alluded to, the, these funds, these fuel revenue funds are sitting at the state, but they can only be used for specific projects. So you have to identify the criteria for a project before you apply to get these funds for, for the project itself. Is that correct? That's correct. So you can't really, like if you have a shortfall, you can't just ask for that money to, for your operating budget. No, those are capital related items. All right. It looks like for the most part the airport um, board does a really good job working with staff out there to um, have 
every single grant that they can pr practically apply for to get because you guys just continually work on the projects. And um, I appreciate your comments about what the public doesn't see not being worked on since the 1980s. I don't even want to try to envision what that looks like back there. So yes, any improvements we can make for the employees, um, I, could, I could totally get on board with that. So uh, that. good luck with your grant funding or your grant applications. Thank, Thank you. you, I yield. All right, uh, I have the floor. Just, just a quick comment. The airport is significant to our community because it is the first impression for so many people. And while it may not be large, it is, it is a wonderful place. And I do want to take advantage of income opportunities that we have in concessions and in parking. I've told, I mentioned to Patrick, I thought we need a little more signage to say where the food is. You, you think it's just too tucked away for me, you know, but to take advantage of that captive audience. But I really appreciate the effort you, you, you and the team go through to make sure that's a beautiful airport, a great first impression that not only welcomes people to Rapid City, but thanks them for coming and I hope they come back, you know, so uh, keep that up. With that, Thank we're you. all done with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> Next, uh, final uh, department, but certainly not least, is the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center. And uh, Craig, do you want to introduce yourself to the council and give any summary statements that you may have? Yes, yes, if I can. First, I need to apologize uh, to you, Mr. Chairman. I greatly misunderstood the format for tonight, so I had to tell Michael back here to cancel the 25-minute PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and if you don't mind, I'm going to page through all my pages of my PowerPoint presentation just to hit a few highlights that either affect our budget or affect the process of the budget. Well, you have a reputation for brevity, so <laughs> I, I, I do know you'll be fine. Uh, first of all, as you all understand, that um, uh, the Civic Center is not a general fund department. The Civic, Sun, uh, uh, Civic Center is funded by two-thirds by its self-generating funding and one-third by the BB&B. &B. Um, and we're also uh, governed by a, a board, uh, a very uh, a board that we meet, meet with uh, a couple times a month. Um, and in addition, I have uh, Jane and Jarrett here who are here to help me back me up on any details that I can't cover with you. Uh, but uh, first of all, I, I wanted to tell you about some initiatives that we had um, that, that either affect the budget or affect the uh, process of the budget. A couple of years ago, we instituted a new program at the Civic Center of not just having the general manager and the finance person working on budgets every year. We're actually uh, taking the budgets down to the department level, the department head level, and uh, the manager level. So they're in charge of their own budgets. And with that, there's been some changes in our budgets, which I'll get to in a second, that you might see that there's a lot of money coming, or go, uh, this, this one department's costing more money, and the other department's costing less money. We're shifting some salaries from one department over to the other department, so the people who are actually manage, managing those people are actually uh, uh, accountable to the budget for those people as well. So there's some shifting in our budget. It's really reallocation, that kind of a thing. Um, skip page two and page three. Uh, this is interesting. Um, uh, a trend for the Civic Center in revenues is over the last six years is a $1.7 million increase. Um, and a t trend in um, uh, the expenditures over the last si same six years is a $1.3 million increase. So our expenditures are not overweighing our, our, uh, our, our revenues. And that's a really good sign. Uh, the Civic Center is very healthy. Skip that page. Um, a couple things in revenues that I wanted to speak about uh, uh, new things. Um, uh, first of all, in our theater series, uh, the series of Broadway shows that we do, um, the trend has been down um, for, since 2011. The trend has been down um, virtually every year since 2011. Um, this is alarming, but it's also uh, somewhat expected because it's also a national trend in theater. Um, what I'd like to report for 2017-18 Broadway series that we're looking at, we're in the middle of selling that right now. Our trend is for the first time since 11 up, and we're talking nearly 30 percent. That is because we we took a stab at it. We paid up. We paid up and got a Broadway series here, and it's really reflecting there. The value in this we're going to see at the end of the season is how well that worked out. But we, we're we're taking more 
risk, more challenge into bringing in uh, and paying up for those kinds of shows to attract and, and turn that Broadway series around the other direction. So that's, a, that's one good thing to see. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out in our uh, revenues is in our budget, we take things like our sales department, a corporate sales is a perfect example of that. Corporate sales is our sponsorship sales. And we push those numbers hard because we want to push our sales guys very hard in that area. All right. In order to adjust for that, uh, the Civic Center operates a little more like a business. We're bringing in revenue and um, we have expenses. Um, we track that very closely all year long. If it looks like we're not going to make that because we went pretty aggressive with that, that budget, we have to uh, uh, track back in some of our expenses and make up for it. We'll always make the budget. Uh, the question is, it might not look exactly the same as we present to you uh, because we're adjusting throughout the year that way. And, and, and by doing what I said earlier, using those managers in control of their own budgets, it's greatly helped that program. And those managers are now uh, uh, more efficient in their own departments. So it's a really good program for us. Another thing in revenues that I wanted to point out, um, you'll see in our capital list there that we have a point of sale system on there. Point of sale in food and beverage, ours is old and antiquated. Um, it's operating on an old system. Now they're all web-based. Um, and it's slow. And if you go to the Civic Center and you want to go get some nachos or whatever, you're waiting in lines, some long lines, depending on how big the event is. Uh, this system we should be able to push those lines further, hopefully creating more sales because how many people walk away when they see long lines. So we're doing those kinds of things in food and beverage. Food and beverage also makes up one-third of our revenue. Um, so there's a a lot of uh, attention since I've been here to pushing for food and beverage and the different things we can do to increase our revenues in that area. Um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, we are doing with the, um, oh, we've branded our catering department. It's no longer the Civic Center Catering because how attractive does that sound? We are now peak a catering. And we are the sole uh, provider for the Civic Center. We no longer allow outside caterers to come in and present food there. And this has greatly changed our whole catering program. Um, we are dumping a little more money into the program, trying to uh, spruce up and get ready for all that business. But uh, it's already proven itself. Um, uh, the other thing is premium food offerings. Uh, it used to be not that long ago people wanted to go to a hockey game or to a sporting event or a concert and have a hot dog and nachos and a Coke. You know, those standard stand food fairs um, are, are not doing it anymore. Um, the history is showing that our normal stand food, our, our, our concession stand food is going down. We're pushing for premium food offerings and offering more choices to folks and also some healthy choices as well. Um, um, that's the same in drinks as well. It used to be all about beer, and now the, ch the tastes have changed. There's more premium offerings that are, are being needed. So we're creating more of that in our budget. So you'll see numbers in our, in our budget where the stand concessions are going down. But we're shifting over to more premium food and that kind of a thing. Um, excuse me. For uh, 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 our expenses, the big changes in, uh, for our expenses is um, our salaries went up 3% from the city average that we're looking at. Um, uncontrollable expenses like utilities and insurances had an effect. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is um, we're trying to do more for our temp labor program, our, our part-time labor program. This has been a struggle ever since I've been at the Civic Center, probably much longer than that. Uh, as you know, we have 42 full-time employees, uh, but on any given night, we have hundreds of part-time employees uh, working for us. Um, we feel very comfortable when we have 700 people in our, in our part-time employee pools, um, and we don't feel very com comfortable when we have 500 people in our part-time employee pools. And last I checked, we're around 450. So this is an area that Every year we're trying to come up with new ways of how we're going to recruit people, working with groups, the different kinds of things that we need to do and improve our employee area. That's an area that we're looking at. We may need to spend a little more money in it, something that we, we might have to do to, so we don't have as many struggles as we have finding part-time help to help us run these events. And um, in our expenses as well, one of the big things that will stand out is what I was saying earlier. We were moving, uh, for example, uh, people that were under the event services department over the production department uh, because that's where they're being managed and that's where the budget needs to lie. So we have some reallocations there. And that's, that's it. 
that's, oh, I have one new event uh, next year. I can't tell you what it is, but it is a festival. It's starting actually in 17, and it'll be an annual event. I'm very excited about it. So that's another new initiative that we've got going on. Well, th that's quite the tease without any payoff. Uh, <laughs> Buy your tickets now. Um, <laughs> that's right. Craig, we got a few people who want to ask you questions. Okay. Um, we're going to start with Alderman Lorenzi. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Craig, I, and I think we've had this conversation before. At least this particular subject has been brought up before. But I think I'm going to be pressing harder this year, and I'm hoping maybe that there will at least be a serious discussion at the board level with the Civic Center, and that is nonprofits and schools and their costs uh, to use the facility. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that the Civic Center will find uh, the board um, and yourself um, would lobby to provide these particular groups a much more favorable uh, fee schedule. And I know that hits your, your business, uh, the acumen of the expenditures and, and the revenues. I get that. Um, but for these nonprofits and especially these schools, they're, they're operating on budgets much the same. They're operating on very thin budgets as well. Has there been any talk over the last year about this particular subject at all? So I'm, I'm sure you're aware that we do offer um, uh, discounts uh, in rent and, and services to non-for-profits and schools. Um, and it's between, uh, depending what kind of an organization you are, a 30% and a 50% discount on, on our rents and services there. And just to let you know, and I, I think you might find this interesting, um, our uh, non-for-profit um, uh, services rentals um, have gone up. Um, we're doing actually more and more than we have in the past. Uh, it's gone up about 5%. And just to give you some figures, on our total rental revenue uh, overall, 65% um, of our rental revenue come from non-for-profit and school organizations. So um, in my opinion, we're extremely healthy there, healthier than any other venue that I've ever operated. Um, but I do understand there are probably some organizations that don't have the budget to fulfill there. Um, certainly we are taking care of a lot of the ones that do have the budget to fulfill there. Um, and I would certainly like to hear more of you know, what, what your ideas would be and how to accommodate that. Yeah, and, and Craig, that's, that's the feedback that I'm getting, and I, I've recently received feedback on this, one from a school and one from a private group. I don't think that they're actually a nonprofit. I think that was just somebody that uh, was a for-profit group complaining about the price. <laughs> we have a few of them. I'm just today. being honest. <laughs> so uh, my question, you know, and, and, and the big ones for me are obviously the nonprofits and the schools, and I appreciate what you're saying there, but I guess what I want to find out is exactly where, the, and I need to come over and, and, and see what you're talking about because you're giving me some information that it depends on the group. Um, that type of thing, and I'm, I'm hoping, um, you know, from school's standpoint, because obviously those, those kids live here. They, you know, they, they rec their recreation is here. Their parents are paying taxes here. The school, you know, the school boards and the uh, property taxes are a big, uh, uh, obviously, budget or big revenue source for schools. Mm -hmm. And so when people, uh, especially smaller schools, you know, some of the private schools as well, those kids are this, in the same boat. I mean, those parents are still paying the full load of property taxes and paying for their private schools. So I'm just, uh, I'd like to come over and speak to you uh, on some day, and I, I will schedule a time, and, and I'd like to get with uh, you on this, this particular subject just to get more fully informed so that I can be more proactive in my communication with these people when they come to me and and uh, we can go from there. I appreciate your time. I would welcome that. Thank you. I highly recommend the tour with Craig as well. It's a good <laughs> educational experience. Um, next up, we got Alderwoman Drew. Finally, something I know about. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, congratulations on your Broadway series. Um, you guys did really step it up this year, and I can see why you're getting great returns on that. So. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, secondly, on the, uh, when you're talking about upscale 
beer and wine sales, I hope that you look local first because we have some great companies here and, uh, and a lot of people are interested in those craft beers. I mean, you wouldn't have to maybe just marry one company. Maybe you could offer a, a, a variety. Mm -hmm. So uh, please, I would just like you to look local first of all. And then, um, you know, uh, we hear in the paper, you see the two cents or whatever, and people are concerned about why we don't get the B and C acts here. Um, you know, by that I mean people like, um, that are going to the fair, or going to um, the Deadwood Mountain Grand, um, the Van Perry, Bare Naked Ladies, Bellamy Brothers. Is there a way to make money on that? Or I, I, why do we not do that during the winter time when no one else is, you know, we don't really want to drive to Deadwood, you know, so why, why aren't we seeing more of that? That's an uh, interesting question because I've been getting a lot of questions about the A acts lately. And so <laughs> well, you're I know about, the B and C about that. Acts, right? <laughs> so um, probably our bread and butter is 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 kind of the B B plus acts, and that's that's our, our bread and butter. Um, uh, we house a certain size of venue that house those uh, events, and when it comes to concerts, that is kind of our bread and butter. Um, when you get down to the C acts or the C level acts, we actually do a number of them. Um, you'd be surprised that probably a lot of them are not marketed to the demographic that's uh, represented in this room. Um, but uh, uh, we, we do a number of them um, throughout the year. Um, we use Rushmore Hall for those, um, where you, 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 or just the floor of the Barnett Arena, maybe. Um, we had a few this year already that did that. Um, we, we do do a number of those. Um, we also, you also see concerts, um, and you're seeing more and more now, concerts in the theater. We're trying to use our theater for more B and C acts as well, because we recognize that the theater was underused for music in the past, so that's something we started last year. We did step it up this year. We just had the Beach Boys. I got Bonnie Raitt, which was really kind of a B act and could be an arena act, you know. Um, so we're, we are using the theater more in that. I think you'll see more of that in the future. I would like to, so thank you for your answer. Yeah. I yield. Okay, getting, getting close to that conversation about the Civic Center and all that other stuff. Oh, I, I just want to kind of keep away from that if we can. Uh, Alderman Nordstrom, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Greg, a couple of quick questions for you on the corporate sponsorship line item that you uh, have on your summary. Yes. Um, I noticed some of the corporate sponsorships, or at least one, has made a pretty good splash in your area by the elevator. Yes. Uh, or, excuse me, the escalator. So, right. What I'm interested in, in is, as uh, Alderwoman Drew mentioned, is local, bringing in local sponsors. Is that possible? Well, um, the, uh, that sponsor was uh, an existing sponsor uh, to the Civic Center prior to me coming there. When I say that sponsor, I'm, t I'm talking about Live Hospitality. Okay, yes. That's who they are. Yes. And Live Hospitality, who uh, has properties here in Rapid and properties in the area. Um, as a conglomerate, they were uh, an existing sponsor at Rapid City. Our salesperson did a great job at selling, upselling uh, uh, him on a, a bigger program. Um, and, and that's what you're seeing there. I do want to point out, and because I have had this talk before, yeah. uh, for example, the Silverado is uh, one of our sponsors there. Silverado is a business partner of ours. We have an outlet in their place, you know, up there. We sell tickets out of their place. So there's business reason for that as well. But also, we, we also, even though we're in Rapid City and we're owned by Rapid City, we're the venue for the region. And we want to invite for our corporate sales and for our budget in our corporate sales, Anybody who wants to come in and, and, and be a partner at the Civic Center and take advantage of a million people coming through our doors every day, and how much would that cost for you to reach a million people through TV? Um, we're a great outlet, and I'm turning this into a commercial now, but we're a great outfit, and I, I would suggest to you that if we stay only local, we don't create the competitive edge in our, uh, in our marketing efforts there. Um, uh, that, that we need to have that to spur the type of uh, 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 marketing, uh, 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 sponsorship marketing that I hope to grow to. Uh, we are trying to increase and have been increasing that, but uh, you know it looks different in that place now than it did, did two years ago. So that is an area that is probably very important to our budgets and our future of growing that. Thank you. Um, one of the other 
red flags that's missing for me, mm -hmm. and I'm glad not, not to see a red flag on this, is your worker comp. I see it's very close to being stable. Can you attribute it to that, something to that? Because a lot of the other departments that I'm looking at, there's uh, either an increase or a decrease in there. Uh, so you're pretty stable. So have you got any way to it? Am I wrong to say that? Cause and effect? Yeah. What's that? One of the Greg, one of the reasons why I'm asking that question is that um, you hire a great number of employees, mm -hmm. and we have to cover them for worker comp. Mm -hmm. And your line item that I'm looking at on, uh, if I can pull it up here, page, nope, it disappeared on me. Sorry, uh, it's it's in the budget there, um, but it, it's essentially staying. It's not red flag, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering how you could. Uh, what are you attributing that to? Well, um, uh, um, if I can't answer this fully for you, and I'll double check with this and get a full answer to you later, um, I will tell you this. We have upped our training programs quite a bit at the Civic Center. Um, we just did uh, forklift training just recently, and we're on our way to doing some CPR training and things like that. So there's a lot more training going on at the Civic Center before. But I, my guess is that why that is level, it's a budget number. We budget a certain amount every year, and that number's been working for us, so we haven't had to raise it. Is that probably an accurate way of saying it? So um, the, I would say that we've just been budgeting pretty accurately recent, uh, in recent years and hadn't had to raise it. I, I'm looking at page 164 when you get a okay. chance to reference it. I will come back to you on that one. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, before we go to the next one, just, just a note, uh, I appreciate the spirit of Alderman Nordstrom's comments on the sponsorships. Uh, I would say that one major sponsor is local. We have to rec recognize a lot of our organizations are regional, and it's a rising tides raise all ships, and so that particular organization has businesses and pays taxes and you know within Rapid City. But uh, I think sponsorships are hard to sell and big time, and so you want to get that money anywhere you can get it, so long as it's in good taste. So <laughs> with that, we'll move on to, uh, oh, before we go to Alderman Lorenzi, I'm going to go to Pauline Sumption. Go ahead, Pauline. So just so you know, finance office gives the departments the calculations on what to use for their work comp calculation. That's why Craig is stumbling a little bit yeah. on how it's done and I think Jared made the comment that we don't budget our own work comp. So we, we give them the, the recommendation for what to put in their budget, the formula. And evidently that number has been working, so. Yeah. So th that number uh, comes from the finance office, that's your, the workers comp oh. number, that's what they were saying, so. And it's based on wages and, and premiums that we paid in 2017, so we base it off of a, a calculation between that so but Pauline wants the credit not Craig okay <laughs> well I just feel she bad because he's up there stumbling a little bit I'm like well he That's, doesn't those know are, because... those are tough questions to answer on the spot we understand yeah all right let's move on to Alderman Laurenti you have the floor sir thank you chair Craig one last thing and I had it written down but I felt like I went a little long on the first one but I got to come back to it I had uh, written down the rally Quite a few years ago, the Civic Center always had something going on. Can you just briefly, I know this was before you, and it, where there, that downturn with the rally. Right. But the Civic Center, and Rapid City as a whole, honestly, doesn't take advantage of such a huge right. rally, except for the people that decide to stay in Rapid City and travel to Sturgis. But I'm saying from the standpoint of events and that type of thing in the park, in the Civic Center. Could you just briefly talk about Certainly, that? Certainly, and I've had that question over the years, too, and it was before my time. Um, the, the Civic Center, the successful thing that happened at the Civic Center during the Rally Week every year was when uh, Harley-Davidson did their showcase of bikes down there. Um, that was very successful, and it worked. And, and it, it went along with the rally, and it really helped. Uh, when that moved out, um, uh, because they built their own showroom up in Sturgis, uh, we lost that piece of business. I've been to Milwaukee and met with uh, Harley Davidson about this subject. 
can we create something new? And they're open to the ideas, but it's, it's a little difficult. They've been very clear to me they're going to use their new room up there. Um, so when you take a look at the history, the uh, other events that the Civic Center's tried um, uh, during that time has been um, fruitless, a loss of money. Because um, what you end up doing, just about anything else you put in there, is competing with the rally. Now, what the public doesn't see is we have some uh, private meetings and private banquets and uh, some small conventions and things like that during the time. Um, I will submit to you that also that it's not such a tragic thing. Um, what I would like to do with the rally, the reason why I would like to do it is to pull more of that economic impact into town here. That's what I would like to do. Um, I would like to host the convention of the Australian Bikers Association or, or, or something like that and try to find that. And I think that's something that we are working on and looking for. I've been talking to the CVB exec, uh, exec of that. But one thing I have to say is that our, our season, our slower season, has shortened up so much in recent years that we have no time to do any projects. So when we get to uh, rally week and uh, fair, uh, the pretty much the August time frame, mm -hmm. we got to get some of our projects done, and and that's what we do uh, during that time right now. But again, I will tell you that if if I can get a big enough show in to compete with a uh, 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 other rally up there, I will. And if I can get an event in there that maybe has something to do with the rally, like a convention, right. like we we're talking about, mm -hmm. we will. All right. I appreciate it, Craig. Thank you. No problem. Craig, that was the final question for you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, as, as a note, we are done for this evening. Just uh, we will continue our discussion with item two on the current agenda Monday night at 530 uh, before our city council meeting. Uh, try to get a little work in uh, at that time. And so you might want to make a note of that. Second. And with that, we are adjourned.